All right. I think we should go ahead and get started. Thank you, Mandy. So at the risk of repeating myself a little bit from the first day, I'd like to say good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everyone joining. I'd like to welcome everyone to this third day of our annual STEG conference. Um, I'll repeat myself to the extent of saying that as you probably know by now, STEG is a research program on structural transformation and economic growth. The program is funded by the United Kingdom's Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office as part of the UK aid effort. And we're really grateful for their support. The program focuses on bringing high quality academic research to bear on problems of importance to low income economies. My name is Doug Gollin. I'm based at Oxford University in the UK. I'm one of the academic leads for STEG, along with my colleague, Joe Kaboski, who chaired most of yesterday's session. And uh, I just want to acknowledge once again, the fantastic support that we receive from the Center for Economic Policy Research in London, which administers the STEG program. I'd particularly like to thank Mandy Chan, who's been handling the logistics of the conference so flawlessly. And I'd also like to single out and to thank Ed Sellers and Kirsty McNeil, who are two of the key people who keep STEG running from the CEPR side. Um, there are a few institutional partners involved in STEG, and I want to acknowledge them once again, in addition to CEPR and to Oxford and to Notre Dame University. I'd like to acknowledge the African Center for Economic Transformation, our colleagues in Accra, Ghana, um, the Yale Research Innovation Initiative on Innovation and Scale, known as YRISE, and the Groningen Growth and Development Center at the University of Groningen in the Netherlands. And I just want to thank again our colleagues uh, and partners there for their support, and also the many other colleagues who've been contributing time and effort to STEG as, as theme leaders, as advisors, as reviewers, as interlocutors. It's an exciting time for STEG. We are at the start of March, we'll enter the third year of the program, and we're continuing to fund uh, research through commissioned uh, commissioned research through competitive calls, even as we hope to begin seeing probably the very earliest fruits of the research that we commissioned last year. So we hope to have a number of opportunities during the year to see some of that research and to present it. I would encourage all of you to have a look at some of our current funding calls that are up and available on the STEG website. We're currently accepting proposals for our second round of larger research grants with a deadline of February 28th. We've already made a number of awards from one round of larger research grants and from two rounds of smaller research grants and one round of PhD grants. Uh, we've also made some very small awards under the rubric of our Ideas for Transformation funding window. And as long as I'm talking about that, I would just encourage particularly those of you based in policy-oriented institutions or government institutions in Sub-Saharan Africa, in Asia, to take a look at, the, at this Ideas for Transformation funding window. We provide uh, grants of about a thousand pounds to support people who can identify and write up uh, in a descriptive way, so no high-tech analysis required, but in a descriptive way to zero in on particular market failures or frictions or policy problems that you think might be worth studying from a macro perspective. And think of this as uh, a kind of pointing, pointing us and pointing the research community towards particular things in your country that you think might be worth taking a deeper look at, might be worth thinking about putting into a model. Um, so we'd love to hear from many of you and we, you can see a few examples of ideas for transformation projects that have currently been funded. Those are up on the web page, And again, we welcome submissions through that window. I wanna move on as quickly as possible to the highlight of uh, the, the next session, which will be our keynote or policy keynote address. Let me just go over a couple of ground rules um, again, probably no need for this after on the third day of a conference and in the second year of the, the world online. Uh, just want to mention that because we're running this not as a webinar, but as a meeting, 
everybody's a participant. That means everybody controls their own microphone and their cameras in the spirit of making this work smoothly. Um, just, I would ask people to remain muted when you're not asking a question. Um, feel free to keep your camera on if, if possible. It's always uh, nice for presenters to see friendly faces. And um, what we'll do for the keynote is I think I'll collect any questions or comments that people have in the chat window, and I'll try to moderate and digest those for our speaker. And we'll hold those, I think, to the end of his talk. Um, but I do welcome your, your contributions in the chat. And what I'll then do is, where possible, I'll turn to the people who pose those questions and ask you to ask you to unmute yourself and put the question to Dr. Kasakende directly. But before I begin with an introduction to the speaker, let me just see if my colleague Joe Kaboski has any additional comments to make or anything else you want to add at this stage. Joe? No, I can't think of any witty wisecracks or anything, so <laughs> just go ahead. Very good. All right. Well, then, without further ado, let me just uh, give a brief introduction to our speaker and um, just say we're really delighted to have Dr. Louis Kasakende with us today. Uh, Dr. Kasakende is the executive director of MEMFI, which is the Macroeconomic and Financial Management Institute, uh, which is of Eastern and Southern Africa. It's a regionally owned institute that currently works most closely with 14 member countries, but has a reach and a policy influence that extends across the whole of Sub-Saharan Africa and, and really an international presence, which um, I encourage people to take a look at Memphis work. Dr. Kasakende uh, is the executive director, but prior to joining Memphi, he was for many years, I guess about 15 years, um, deputy, deputy governor of the Bank of Uganda and uh, has served for a long time as one of the leading voices not only in Uganda, but in Eastern Africa, Eastern and Southern Africa on issues around macroeconomic management. His career goes before that, he's worked as the chief economist of the African Development Bank um, for a number of years in from 2006 to 2009, and has also been an executive director at the World Bank. So he's been involved in a number of the international institutions, He's worked with the UN system, and he has just an astonishing uh, record of public service in his work in economics. He has a, a doctorate and a master's from University of Manchester, um, so a proud, a proud graduate of uh, one of our colleague institutions, our, and, um, and he's been a productive academic author as well. So without going into further uh, and embarrassing detail. Dr. Kesakende, let me turn this over to you and we look forward to your remarks. I will again collect any comments and questions in the chat and try to digest them for you at the end of your remarks. Uh, thanks a lot uh, for that introduction. It is a very great pleasure for me to address you during this uh, January 2022. Oxford uh, University Conference on Structural Transformation and uh, Economic Growth. And to the organizers, my heartfelt gratitude for the platform you have offered to me uh, to address distinguished participants on the theme of this conference and hope that my contribution will be useful in stimulating discussions to achieve policy sustainability and improve on the modest gain made so far in this area. I will focus on structural transformation and economic growth in Sub-Saharan Africa, applicability of the East Asian structural transformation and economic growth model to Sub-Saharan Africa. The key questions are firstly, can the East Asian model be applied to Sub-Saharan Africa? Secondly, can Sub-Saharan Africa attain sustainable growth and create jobs without a strong manufacturing base, transitioning from agriculture directly to services. In this regard, I will provide views on the applicability of the East Asian structural transformation and the economic growth model to sub-Saharan African economies, 
I will then make policy recommendations guided by the key lessons from East Asia growth experience on what Sub-Saharan Africa economies could possibly do. It is not difficult to understand why the Sub-Saharan African countries would look to East Asia for lessons or alternative models of economic growth and development. The East Asian countries were quite comparable to several Sub-Saharan African countries in the 1950s. And one could even add that the prospects looked brighter for the African countries compared to East Asian countries during the time. In terms of development approach, both regions began an early drive for import substitution industrialization, but diverged substantially in terms of industrial policy and performance. Since the era of structural adjustment began in Africa, roughly about 1990, although the dates at which different countries began implementing structural adjustment policies varied, according to the World Bank 2020, Per capita real GDP growth in Sub-Saharan Africa has averaged 0.6% per annum. The growth performance improved slightly after 2000, but only to 1.3% per annum. Registering a real GDP per capita in 2020 of 1,564 from an average of 1,000 in 1960. For instance, Ghana, Zambia, Uganda recorded average growth rates in real GDP per capita. For Ghana, 3%, Zambia, 1%, and Uganda, 3% per annum, respectively, in the period 1990 to 2020. In contrast, the developing economies of East Asia and the Pacific starting at about the same level of the average real per capita income in 1960, averaged 6.8% annual real per capita income growth during that same period, 1990 to 2020, realizing average real GDP per capita of 11,129 in 2020, that's the average, seven times that of sub-Saharan Africa. And you, there are cases like Singapore with 58,000, China with 10,000, and Japan 34,000 in 2020. Of course, Africa's poor average performance masks a high degree of hetero, heterogeneity across the continent. And there are other factors besides the economic models pursued, which have held back growth in sub-Saharan Africa. Nonetheless, it is difficult to avoid the conclusion that Asian countries have pursued much more successful development strategies than those in sub-Saharan Africa, particularly Korea, South Korea, Taiwan, Singapore, China, and now Vietnam, all of which achieved very high rates of growth sustained over several decades. Underlying the growth performance in uh, East Asia, the manufacturing sector has been central to absorbing a significant proportion of the labor force and placing them in productive, decent jobs. In addition, there is a strong interaction among the member countries via trade and investment. In this regard, what is the development model which these economies successfully pursued and how does it differ from the economic strategies pursued in sub-Saharan Africa? In terms of uh, this presentation, I will cover five aspects of the topic. I'll have an introduction, extent and the nature of structural transformation in sub-Saharan Africa, the extent and nature of structural transformation in East Asia. Then I'll have uh, a discussion of some key lessons and policy recommendations for Sub-Saharan Africa region and conclusion. Because of data limitations, I will not be able to cover each country in the East Asia and Sub-Saharan Africa regions. Instead, I will focus on the region and pick notable examples where appropriate. This conference is taking place at a time 
when the world is still facing adverse effects of the COVID-19 pandemic, and it is hard for me to ignore its impact on the economies and the lives it has claimed. Since the advent of this pandemic, economic growth has significantly slowed down, international trade disrupted, domestic revenues and foreign exchange receipts reduced significantly, while public expenditure requirements are escalating as governments seek to reduce the spread of the pandemic, protect and cushion societies, and attempt to minimize the adverse impact of the pandemic on the economies. In relation to the topic of discussion today, it is worth noting that structural transformation is going to be derailed by COVID-19, thus putting more pressure on the sub-Saharan African countries, most of whom have not been registering good progress. So I move on to the section that deals with structural transformation and growth in sub-Saharan Africa. To a large extent, historical, economic, social, and political experiences of sub-Saharan Africa are determinants of its current and future economic development. According to Page uh, 2012, externally imposed structure adjustment programs and reform initiatives of the 1980s, 1990s, failed to promote productivity, labor employment, and poverty reduction in sub-Saharan Africa. The pursuit of these structure adjustment programs focused a lot on re-establishing macroeconomic stability and liberalization of markets, especially for trade, foreign exchange, and finance. There has been limited attempt to use the real exchange rate as a policy tool to promote international competitiveness and trade. Equally, countries have made limited use of government support for industry and any systematic effort to change the structure of production. These sentiments have been expressed by many others. Hang Jung Chang expressed them in 2018 and Justin Lin also in 2011 to name a few. The above statements mask differences in policies and outcomes across Africa. And indeed, there are other factors beyond economic models pursued, such as the lack of industry-oriented capacity building initiatives, including the transfer of know-how as part of the structure adjustment programs. For example, in Ethiopia, under the government led by the late Mele Zenawi, there was a systematic effort to promote investment in labor-intensive manufacturing for export by offering incentives to mainly foreign investors. Similarly, Uganda has started promoting industrialization using a similar model, and this has been covered by Gobi. To support the move, Uganda's industrial policy is back on the government of Uganda's development agenda. The government has combined providing subsidies directed at individual farms with an investment in key infrastructure, including electricity, roads, optic fiber backbone for internet, more recently the railway line, and, in, and setting up industrial parks in support to economic activities in general and industrialization in particular. There are signs of a positive response to these policies with a marked growth in manufacturing companies, despite challenges to do with planning and the manner in which industrialization should be done. Notwithstanding efforts being made for most sub-Saharan African, for most countries in sub-Saharan Africa, the manufacturing sector has not supported structural transformation of the economies. Evidence shows that as of 2020, 23 sub-Saharan African countries are classified by the World Bank under low-income countries, and 50 of them are further classified as fragile and conflict-affected. 16 are classified under lower middle-income economies, six under upper middle-income economies, and only one under the high income economies, and that is Seychelles. Under all these groups, there are sub-Saharan African countries, which are resource rich. These include Nigeria, Angola, Equatorial Guinea, 
Tanzania, Zambia, Botswana, and the DRC, the Democratic Republic of Congo. The resource-rich countries have pursued uh, very varied growth strategies where commodity booms have propelled growth, while slumps have had adverse effects on these economies. Notably, natural resources, natural resource focus has delayed economic diversification in some countries to the extent that lack of diversification in Sub-Saharan Africa has been largely driven by countries with abundant natural resources. During the earlier decades until 1980, economic development in Sub-Saharan Africa has been sporadic and only moderate with an annual average GDP growth rate of less than 2% per annum, which is well below the average of 4%. Slow growth rates in Sub-Saharan Africa were especially evident in manufacturing and services sector. While agriculture was largely of a subsistence nature, and did not benefit from technological transformation. This to a great extent accounts for the poor performance of a, of a majority of countries. In addition, the region was characterized by periods of sustained political instability, strict trade barriers and market regulation, weak infrastructure development, prolonged conflicts and macroeconomic distortions. Between 1980 and 2020, some of the Sub-Saharan African countries, Uganda, Tanzania, Ghana, Mauritius, and Kenya, as examples, started designing and implementing economic policies to accelerate growth of sectors with high value added per work as strategies for structural change. With considerable divergence in growth experience, the Sub-Saharan African region started registering annual average growth rates of about 4%. This period has been referred to in several publications as the booming spell for Sub-Saharan Africa, characterized by declining poverty, an emerging middle-class democratization, urbanization, thriving construction industry, an expanding services sector and an ever increasing exports of raw materials, partly because of a strong increase in international commodity prices. So we need now to look at the extent and nature of structural transformation during this long period. Sub-Saharan Africa has followed a singular pattern of structure change where resource allocation favored one sector at the expense of the other. While focus has shifted to services and manufacturing, agriculture has been the mainstay of most economies. The important role of agricultural sector in contributing to food security and the economy generally is reflected in the prioritization in the development agenda. The Comprehensive African Agricultural Development Program CADIP is an integral part of the new partnership for Africa's development, NEPAD, and the sector's prominence in the region is evident in its contribution to total GDP, which is generally high in the global context. Despite the recognition of the critical role of agriculture in many sub-Saharan African countries, the sector has not always been preferred in public expenditure and programs. The sector suffers from several challenges that constrain its performance across the different countries, including soil fertility, limited availability of the key enablers, water, power, credit, limited access to key agricultural extension services, um, accessibility to, to markets, land tenure patterns and practices, Extra and extra, and there are also too much dependency on rain-fed agriculture. Consequently, the share of agriculture value added to GDP in Sub-Saharan Africa started declining significantly from 29% of GDP in 1980 to 20% in 2020, as per the data published by the World Bank. At an individual country level, the share of agriculture of agricultural value added to GDP in Ethiopia, as an example, dropped from 50% to 
In the case of Uganda, from 50% to about 24. And in the case of Ghana, from 50% to about 18 by the 2020. Despite its relatively declining share of total GDP, primary commodity agriculture remains an important sector as a source of food, intermediate products, employment, and as a major earner of foreign exchange. Agriculture employed more than half of the total labor force and within the rural population provides a livelihood for multitudes of small scale producers. Smallholder farms constitute approximately 80% of all farms in Sub-Saharan Africa and employ about 175 million people directly, according to the Alliance for Green Revolution in Africa. While there has been a significant decline in, in the agricultural sector, value added, agricultural sector value added as a percentage of GDP, the value added by services as a percentage of GDP gained momentum from about 44% of GDP in 1980 to 48% in 2020. South Africa, Ethiopia, Uganda, and Ghana were among the countries which contributed to this side. But data from the World Bank and the IMS, IMF also reveals a high degree again of diversity among the countries. The key lesson for this is that economies have been transiting from natural resource-based activities, such as those in the agricultural sector, towards other sectors, especially the services sector, bypassing manufacturing. For sub-Saharan African countries, the ease, the ease of entry into the service sector is relatively higher than into manufacturing sector, resulting in more labor moving from agriculture to the services sector compared to manufacturing. Much of the services sector is also informal with less requirements than uh, manufacturing. There has been a sectoral shift in labor force employment, but that has mainly consisted of labor moving from peace and agriculture into informal non-traded micro enterprises in urban areas, such as petty trading and motorcycle transport. Labor productivity in the informal non-traded micro enterprises is low and lacking in dynamism. These sectors cannot be the drivers of growth in a high growth economy. Now, be it in terms of employment and value added GDP, manufacturing has never really flourished in much of Sub-Saharan Africa. The average number of people employed in manufacturing industry has been rather flat at slightly over 10% of the total labor employment and shows no sign of improvement between 1991 and 2019. The modern industries which operate in Sub-Saharan Africa, such as minerals and fuel, telecommunications and finance, employ a very small fraction of the labor force. The trend of, in most of the countries is towards deindustrialization, which has not been reversed by the recent growth episodes. The main contributing factors include business environment uncertainties, tight competition from imports, the high labor costs, energy deficiencies, inadequate transport infrastructure, and poorly functioning credit markets. So despite recent improvements in the business climate, few countries in Sub-Saharan Africa offer attractive conditions for manufacturing investment compared to alternative locations, such as those in East Asia. In May of 2000, the African Growth and Opportunity Act, AGOA, was launched. The act provided eligible Sub-Saharan African countries with duty-free access to the US market for over 1,800 products, in addition to more than 5,000 products that are eligible for duty-free access under the generalized system of preferences program. Many researchers postulated that AGOA would provide the much needed support to the manufacturing sector in Sub-Saharan Africa 
and focus the region to export-led economic growth policies. Backed by the introduction of AGOA between 2000 and 2020, the average share of manufacturing as a percentage of GDP for Sub-Saharan Africa was 11% per annum, one percentage point increase from, from historical trends. The increase in manufacturing as a share of GDP was most noticeable in a few Sub-Saharan African countries like Uganda and Lesotho. But it also dropped for some others like Nigeria, Ghana, Zambia, and Kenya. So in practice, the expectation that AGOA would spur manufacturing growth has not been met. However, in response to the AGOA initiatives, most countries in Sub-Saharan African region, among them Lesotho, Eswatini, Zambia, Zimbabwe, Ghana, embarked on strategies to ensure that mediating factors are in place. These include government policies related to promotion of foreign direct investment and trade, labor markets, systems of learning and innovation, finance, taxation, as well as other infrastructure support to ensure that domestic firms competed. So notwithstanding increased movement into services sector, the aspect of the productivity of services sector is still under scrutiny as this sector is considered generally unproductive with limited backward and forward linkages as compared to manufacturing. Countries that have achieved growth and development without factories and through services are too scarce and peculiar to serve as role models. However, given technical progress in services and lack of credible alternatives in manufacturing in Sub-Saharan Africa, the question of which way to go remains open. The long-term impact um, of structure adjustment policies in Sub-Saharan Africa is mixed. The better performing economies, mainly those which have implemented economic policies consistently and avoided civil strife, have improved their economic performance. Macroeconomic stability has greatly improved in the era of structure adjustment. Long-term real per capita growth rates have been positive and the living standards of the population have gradually risen alongside other aspects of human welfare, such as health. What structure adjustment policies have failed to achieve in Sub-Saharan Africa is any sort of meaningful structure transformation of the economic structures. So unlike in the fast growing economies of Asia, labor in Sub-Saharan Africa has not shifted out of low productivity, informal employment into high productivity, formal sector, modern industries. But it's not altogether surprising that structure adjustment programs in Sub-Saharan Africa failed to bring about structure transformation. Structural adjustment policies prioritize liberalized markets so that market, sig market price signals determine resource allocation. Market signals provide incentives for incremental changes, but they can prevent more fundamental changes needed for structural transformation. They generally do not give strong signals to the private sector to invest in new industries or un undertake quantitative leaps in technology. The emphasis on market-oriented policies in structure adjustment programs reflects the dominant intellectual paradigm in Western economies, that of neoclassical economics. But this paradigm neglects production because its primary focus is on trade and allocative efficiency. In effect, it treats all producers as identical, making no distinction between informal micro enterprises and large scale modern industry. Whereas this distinction is critical for structural transformation and has been integral to the Asian model of development. In the early stages of structure adjustment, market oriented policies often brought about substantial gains, mainly by removing policy induced bottlenecks to production, such as shortages of foreign exchange, imports and credit, but once these gains were realized, essentially restoring output to its, its production possibility frontier, 
market-oriented policies have not been able to lift African economies to the next level of development. Let me now move on to the extent and the nature of structural transformation in East Asia. In sharp contrast to Sub-Saharan Africa, countries in East Asia have grown much faster than those in other regions, and with some of them now nearing the OECD member countries regarding industrialization. The overall development strategy and industrial policy in East Asia resulted in high growth rates, with eight countries in this region, China, Hong Kong, Mongolia, South Korea, Taiwan, registering rapid economic growth, double digit growth rates in the 1990s and sustained the momentum over the years. Countries largely followed export-oriented development strategies with high government intervention and guided industrialization. China, Malaysia, Thailand embarked on promoting manufacturing exports and substantial public expenditures on infrastructure development to lay down infrastructure for the private sector to operate, accompanied by close monitoring of the market system. Big business corporates emerged as the engine of growth dominating in South Korean economy. In Taiwan, small and medium-sized enterprises played a central role in economic growth and development. East Asian countries have maintained rapid and relatively sustained economic growth with a sharp increase in manufacturing sector's share of the total output and labor employment. They have experienced a growing diversification of industrial production that permits each country to broaden its range of manufactured goods. And over the years, the respective countries have identified sources of diversity and exploited them successfully. In terms of structural transformation, the distinct regional characteristics of East Asia include the following among others. The region went through basic economic structure changes with complementary rather than competing economic structures. All the countries initially focused on technologically simple labor intensive goods like clothing, toys and processed foods. This stage facilitated technology transfer. However, the speed of graduation from these types of industries varied across the respective countries. Moves into a range of more capital intensive technologically sophisticated items were always initiated by the four first tier newly industrializing economies, thereby vacating export markets that were filled by the second tier group. The region made optimum use of comparative advantage with specialization by respective economies. Dynamism of technological upgrading followed that of the, that of the leading economies, which characterized the industrial development process. And agriculture in most of these East Asian countries accounts for less than 15% of their respective uh, GDP. So what are the key lessons and policy recommendations for the sub-Saharan African region? If, if, if sub-Saharan Africa is to achieve structural transformation, a change in the economic strategy appears necessary. Simply continuing with the same policies implemented over the last three decades is unlikely to bring about better results in the future. So could Sub-Saharan Africa achieve structural transformation by adopting all or part of the Asian model? It seems unrealistic for Sub-Saharan Africa to be able to reproduce the success of the Asian tigers in developing labor intensive, export oriented manufacturing industries as the engine of economic growth. The labor costs in African manufacturing are much higher than in the Asian economies with comparable per capita income levels. That would suggest that in, in general, labor intensive manufacturing in Sub-Saharan Africa is unlikely to be competitive on export markets. Furthermore, if labor costs in Sub-Saharan Africa were more globally competitive, 
advances in the use of robotics to displace labor in manufacturing may close off any window of opportunity for the newly emerging industrial economies to thrive in export markets in a manner like that achieved in the past by the Asian economies. Nevertheless, there is a critical element of the Asian model, which merits the attention of policymakers in Sub-Saharan Africa. The emphasis accorded to production structures and promoting change in these structures. To realize structural transformation, there needs to be a much greater priority by economic strategies to supporting the development of uh, domestic production capacities, especially in sectors which have the potential to generate sustained increases in labor productivity and achieve sustained growth in output. An obvious starting point is the modernization and commercialization of peasant agriculture, which will require comprehensive packages of support from government to small farmers including subsidized inputs, fertilizers, seeds, and credit, public research and extension services, minimum farm gate price supports, and protection from imports. Such policies have had some success in other parts of the developing world, including the Asian countries, in promoting the Green Revolution. Agricultural modernization, which generates large increases in marketed farm outputs, is a precondition for the development of agro industries on a large scale, which could offer African countries an important source of comparative advantage on the world markets and thereby provide an engine for growth. Economic policymakers should also consider providing support to promote domestic import substituting industries, which at least have the potential to be competitive at the regional level through, for example, moderate tariff protection, preferential public procurement, investment tax credits. However, such support should be provided at the regional level through regional economic communities because individual national economies are mostly too small to enable import substituting firms to reach optimal economies of scale or to allow meaningful competition in the domestic market. Support should also be provided at the level of the industry rather than to individual farms, so that all farms operating in a specific market within a rank face a level playing field. Sub-Saharan Africa should also explore ways to intensify intra-Sub-Saharan African trade and maximize opportunities offered by the African continental free trade area while remaining open to the rest of the world. There are also five major regional trade agreements in each initiatives which show potential and willingness to unite within Sub-Saharan Africa. They include the West African Economic and Monetary Union, Central African Economic and Monetary Community, the SAPU South African Customs Union, COMESA, the Common Market for Eastern and Southern Africa, and uh, the Eastern African Community. There is a delicate balance to be maintained between providing support to targeted industries and ensuring that all firms within these industries remain subject to competitive pressures. While our earlier views are that only the manufacturing sector can drive convergence, given that services show low productivity, weak growth, and lack of convergence. Contrary recent evidence suggests that productivity converges in several services industries and that Sub-Saharan Africa's performance in key sectors, such as transport, energy, and telecommunications, gives grounds for optimism regarding the services sector in Sub-Saharan Africa. All the policies discussed above, where, whether for agriculture or industry, will need to be implemented systematically and consistently over the long term, because structural change is a long-term project. Critical to the implementation of these policies is the need to strengthen institutions and for Sub-Saharan Africa to address governance issues that may introduce distortions 
and constrain individual countries or regions in attaining the full benefits of structural policies. So in conclusion, given the past and the current trends in economic growth and structural transformation in Sub-Saharan Africa and East Asia, as well as the differences in strategy, a radical reappraisal of the merit of market-oriented policies in Sub-Saharan Africa is warranted. While it is not feasible to replicate the Asian model of development in its entirety in Sub-Saharan Africa, key components of that model, notably providing public support to domestic producers at the industry-wide level on a sustained and consistent basis, and a careful balance between market and government deserves serious consideration. Given the current cross-country differences among the countries in terms of approach and status of development, it is unlikely that Sub-Saharan Africa can, in the short term, have most of the countries unifying or harmonizing their approaches to development. I thank you for listening to me. Thank you so very much, Dr. Kasakende, for a really interesting and thought-provoking talk. Um, we've got quite a bit of time for discussion. There are questions being uh, entered into the meeting chat, and I'll try to get to a number of those in a minute. I, I wonder if I wonder if I can abuse the chair's privilege and maybe ask you just first to comment on where your views seem to sit relative to the relative to the broader policy conversations that are taking place in African governments in international institutions where I suspect that the, the commitment to replicating the East Asian model retains a lot, of, a lot of support. I tend to hear policymakers talk about, talk still about reproducing the East Asian experience and uh, your, I would say, guarded, guarded skepticism towards the applicability, the direct applicability, shall I say, of that model. I wonder if that, how you see that message being received and, and um, how you feel that the conversation is taking shape within the region. Um, I think, well, the discussion is good uh, and you can always draw lessons, especially, especially from uh, a very successful experience. Uh, in East Asia. But I would hasten to add that let us not just go and pick the model from East Asia and try to replicate it uh, in Africa. The times have changed uh, a lot. Individual countries uh, since 1990 have gone through policy episodes and uh, it would require rolling back. So what I have said in this presentation is, can we pick certain aspects of that model that could be applicable to our situation? I think we can achieve a lot from regions, regionalism in, uh, in Africa. Uh, if we can, in, uh, implement the tariff and non-tariff uh, elements of, uh, of uh, regionalism. It has shown that it can be a very powerful tool. Uh, take the case of uh, East African community. And if you go through the manufactured exports of Tanzania or even Uganda, you will see that most of the markets are in East African region, coming out as benefits from implementing the provisions of the East African community. There is the whole issue of uh, support to industries and protecting industries. There are times when uh, we, we draw the wrong lessons uh, from East Asia, and we choose winners. And you can you have several examples uh, in 
especially East Africa that I know very well. The issue is, should we support those individual farms? When do you say, well, this particular farm will not make it. It will never be, it will never have a competitive advantage beyond the nation state. And you reduce or stop uh, supporting. That's why in the presentation I've said, it would be better given even the level of governance in this region to have support to industries, not individual farms, but let it be to industries. And I've gone even a, a further step. Is it possible to have this support at a regional level? Can we negotiate and come to some position of supporting these industries at uh, a regional level? My third point on, uh, on uh, the issue of the real exchange rate, it is highly unlikely that the countries in Sub-Saharan Africa will ever use uh, the real exchange rate to gain a competitive advantage, given the models that they are using now in macroeconomic management. So that's my initial reaction. Let us not just pick the model and try to replicate it in Africa. Let us be selective. Let us look at the elements that can work. Thanks, that's great. Um, Hagen has a couple of questions or at least one question, I think that I'll ask him to unmute and put to you directly. Yes, uh, thank you, Doug. If you allow me, I, I think I have two questions in total. Uh, but first of all, I think that was a wonderful presentation. Thank you very much. Um, so the first question uh, would be, uh, I would ask you to expand a bit uh, on the role of trade, especially focusing on the trade outside of Sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, so now you mentioned the regional trade agreements, um, but if we are thinking about the expansion of formal large firms in Sub-Saharan Africa, which are really the uh, very productive jobs um, that, that uh, create a lot of value added for economies. Uh, in the long run, um, my impression is that uh, Sub-Saharan Africa would need to uh, um, substitute some of the manufacturing imports that they're gaining or like the yeah, goods that they're importing from Asia, for instance, and be able to produce them themselves. Um, do you think that might be a realistic policy concept that um, African economies might be uh, competitive enough in terms of skill, in terms of um, production technologies available to, to in the long run follow such a policy. And the second question, very shortly, um, you put a high emphasis on heterogeneity within sub-Saharan African countries, which I liked a lot. Um, but then when you talked about industrialization, you very broadly spoke for all sub-Saharan African countries that they're stagnating at around 10%. Um, employment or value added per, per GDP. Um, but don't you think that there are quite some countries like Ghana, Kenya, Ethiopia, even Senegal that uh, recently achieved quite some industrializations, quite some gains in manufacturing employment, and that it might be a bit premature to just uh, say that industrialization in Sub-Saharan Africa's um, policy that shouldn't be followed. Thank you. Uh, can I just... Uh, uh at least uh, correct, maybe an impression that uh, countries should not support industrialization. I mean, if that is uh, the impression from this presentation, I think that's not the case. Um, I have said at the same time that the, the experience of Africa has not been very good. So that's number one. If you look at it from the period 1960 to uh, 2020. Unfortunately, I'm using averages, and uh, I've, that's why I even brought out this issue of diversity uh, among the countries. But there were countries that where you see uh, an increase in the share of manufacturing as countries implemented uh, structural adjustment programs where there was a revival of uh, uh, industries, especially for supply to the domestic market, if the market is big, or supply to the regional market. And I, I want to link it back to your point 
on the role of trade in uh, growth and development. If you look at uh, uh, the 1980s, even 70s, where country, a number of countries maintained overvalued exchange rates, it had a, an adverse impact on exports and constrained growth and development. And when you compare that to the 1980s where countries started eliminating uh, overvaluation, it, there is a boost to trade. And I think that's one of the things that uh, comes out of the structure adjustment policies. There was an increase in, uh, in exports and that is, extreme, is vital, uh, vital in uh, supporting growth. Unfortunately, most of the revival was in primary and semi-processed uh, goods. I think if you look at the uh, exports, manufactured exports most of, in most of these countries, maybe with the exception of uh, uh, South Africa, most of these countries are not exporting manufactured goods to the developed countries. Very few have been able to break uh, into those markets. But a number of them are, are breaking into regional markets. And that, is, that needs to be supported. And I think it should be supported even with uh, uh, tariff protection at a regional level. So it goes to your second point, should African countries also start looking at some of these industries that are producing import substitution goods? Yes, and especially at a regional level, we should look at that. And I think uh, I've seen some efforts in uh, even countries like Uganda now is going into this, into this direction. But as I have said, uh, we should be very careful supporting individual farms we need to be very careful with the, the governance issues that are associated with choosing winners that need also to be addressed. So I'm Thank not- Thank you very much. Yeah, I'm not dismissing manufacturing completely. So I think next I'm gonna to turn to Nicola who has a question that uh, maybe takes you back to your, to your deputy governor role. Uh, Nicola, go ahead. Thank you, Doug. Uh, Neil, thank you to Dr. Kazakende. I, I think that was very interesting and very intellectually engaging. Many of us in this virtual room are looking for, you know, inputs. And uh, also, you know, thank to Doug and Joe and the other organizers of the conference, both for the choice of papers and this. I think it's inspiring for many of us, especially in these times, you know, the second year of COVID. Uh, my question is the following. Given your experience in central banking, which frictions and constraints do you think that the financial sector in Africa faces, banking in particular? Uh, because, you know, that would be valuable. Just, you know, one small. I used to spend a lot of time in Africa, in Ivory Coast and Ethiopia. And for example, uh, central bankers used to complain about long-term finance and the lack of long-term finance, blaming bankers. But bankers were complaining about the fact that, you know, discount window facilities are missing, Interbank markets are missing, the deposits are very volatile, and so they are unable to supply this long-term finance. You know, that was very inspiring for me, for other colleagues to study these topics, to study interbank markets. I mean, from your experience, what, what, what should we study? Um, it is going to be a number of areas. Definitely where the countries, a number of the countries have started, I think is very good. We needed to strengthen institutions. I think for a number of institutions, especially during the 80s, we had a number of institutions that were weak and were tolerated by the regulatory system. So the starting point is you strengthen institutions, you strengthen regulation. So that is number one. And you have institutions that are well capitalized. And it will only be well capitalized, well run institutions that will support a credit system in, uh, in any country. So that's number one. The second one is the structure of the deposits in a number of these countries. Um, if you look at the structure of deposits, most of the deposits are demand deposits. You rarely see 
uh, um, medium long term deposits. And it constrains intermediation uh, by uh, within the banking system. And uh, it's, it becomes extremely difficult for banks to support long term financing using such highly volatile. But I'm not saying that 10 years on this. So I, I see yes. that is a lot. That's that then, took a while. The other issue is the one of risk assessment, uh, risk assessment within individual institutions, which can be addressed through training, through partnerships. But there is also the whole issue of moving very fast to the regulatory standards coming out of uh, uh, BIS, mm. where the, the amount of capital that institutions need to hold is very substantial. And the way you are classifying non-performing uh, loans, it ends up imposing very heavy costs on the institutions. And uh, you find that the intermediation costs are very high. Um, I'll give you examples. Um, take the case of Uganda. I can use Uganda because I was in Uganda for some time. We have inflation of about 5%. And you find that uh, medium long-term loans are at about 15%. So 10%. And it is extremely difficult. So then what should we do? Uh, I've always argued that... Uh, countries need to support the development banks where elements of subsidy can be provided and uh, government can provide um, uh, deposits, government deposits or credit lines. So that's one. But the development banks must be efficiently run. I don't want development banks that are an extension of the Ministry of Finance, where development banks are there to dispense instructions from the Ministry of So uh, independence. Well, independence is very critical, but also capacity to assess risks within the development banks. So start with regulation. If, if you ask me a starting point, it is extremely difficult having a banking system where the central bank on a daily basis, on a monthly basis, annual basis, is bailing out financial institutions. That's extremely valuable. Thank you very much. Thanks very much. Um, Emmanuel, I think you've got the next question in line. Can you unmute yourself? I think we're not yet hearing you. Okay. Uh, thank you so much, and uh, thanks, Tech, for organizing this uh, wonderful event. Um, Dr. Louis Kasek, and I want to ask a question about the role of leadership uh, in driving uh, economic growth. Uh, basically, I want you to give uh, some highlights about the role of leadership and governance uh, in driving economic growth, especially in Sub Saharan Africa. Uh, we, I can give a case of Rwanda, our neighbor here. Uh, you look at the leadership that Gagame has given and uh, the leadership given you know, in other countries, which are even uh, rich in terms of resources. I look at a country like Uganda compared to Rwanda. But then uh, we seem to be struggling and you see a lot of you know, uh, emphasis putting in non-priority sectors in terms of expenditures, uh, for example, the president, uh, you know, um, allocating a lot of resources like to security, even when there is no war. And then you ignore sectors that are really, really relevant, like agriculture. So what is your say about uh, these issues? Thank you. Um, leadership is so, is very critical for, any economy. Uh, it is from the leadership that you will get policies. It is from leadership that, they are, that will provide signals for the private sector to make decisions. If the private sector
cannot make a proper risk assessment, if the leadership cannot provide that information for the private sector to make the correct risk assessment and decisions, we shall end up having short-term investments. People will not take risks to invest in a country over a, long, a longer horizon. So that's number one. But I think also it is going to come from leadership to strengthen institutions, institutions that relate with the private sector, institutions that are responsible for regulation. If we don't develop those institutions, then it is going to be extremely difficult having, um, having a medium to long-term uh, investments. Number three that also must come from uh, leadership is the good governance. I think uh, corruption will always be a source of distortions and uh, not each and every potential investor can na navigate that system that has got uh, those distortions. So it is from the leadership, it is from the government that you can have a level playing field. I have placed a lot of emphasis on, uh, on regionalism. It is going to take strong leadership to promote regionalism. If we have weak nation states and weak leaders, they will not be able to implement uh, uh, the protocols that support regional economic communities. So you are very right, leadership must be addressed. Fantastic, thank you. Thanks, we have two questions, Dr. Kesekende, on agriculture, and I thought I might ask the two speakers or the two questioners to give them to you in sequence before you respond. So let, okay. me, let me first ask Alain de Gendry and then Diego Rastusia in, in that order. And I'll just let you unmute yourselves and put the question and maybe you can answer in one piece. Okay, thank you, Dr. Kasekende. This was a very good presentation. And I like in particular your focus on agriculture uh, given the deindustrialization and low productivity services. We heard yesterday from uh, Nancy Benjamin that much of the structural transformation ends up in uh, informal sector firms that do not contribute much to productivity in the uh, industrial service environment. But I was wondering if uh, the effort towards agriculture should be reconsidered in the state of being focused on the supply side, namely green revolution, a green revolution for Africa, raising productivity in stable foods towards a mo much more demand driven approach where we build value chains and we make sure that we start from demand as it exists in the urban environment. Doug has done important work showing that uh, the uh, agriculture does not really match quite often the uh, demand in the urban environment. And as a consequence, we see a rapid, a rapid rise in imports. So the, emph the emphasis would be much more towards value chain development and using the value chains as an engine of modernization of smallholder farmers in response to demand that would be promoted by value chain development. So I would like to hear your thoughts about it. Thank you. Diego? Yeah, thanks, Doug. Um, um, very quickly, um, as you pointed out, this, the you know, productivity growth in agriculture is very important for structural transformation in Africa. And I just was wondering, uh, what you thought about uh, the academic work that has been emphasizing land consolidation, increases in farm size uh, in, in, you know, in, in, in aiding productivity growth. And in particular, um, especially as, as a policymaker, the, the role that land markets can play in, la in, in guiding this land relocation, given that um, you know, severe constraints, institutional constraints on land markets in Africa. Thank you. Dr. Kasajende. Yes, uh, very interesting uh, uh, questions. Uh, on uh, the first one, uh, where demand would provide the information to, to the farmers. I think uh, one, I think the problem that I see is that 
the producers are very small. You need to organize them to be able to negotiate the prices. Uh, you need to organize them maybe in cooperatives so that they can relate to uh, these sources of demand. I have some examples. Um, they, are, they are contract farmers in Uganda, uh, be it in sugarcane, in, uh, we've had cases of uh, even tobacco, where we've had uh, uh, contract farmers, and the buyer is so powerful that the farmers are not would be exposed if they are not an organized uh, group of uh, of farmers. It they, they, we've had some success stories in contract. Uh, 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 farming, but you need to some regulatory environment to manage this relationship between the buyer and uh, the supplier. So that's number one. But the other one I have is where uh, certain companies that were going to export goods did also use contract farmers. And I think for reasons associated with the uh, the markets that they had uh, obtained, they did not come back to the farmers to buy the produce. Now, the farmer has already invested heavily in the produce. And in most cases, that produce does not have a domestic market. Uh, so you, 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 the farmer is left without an alternative. I think we can ex uh, study this further. And it, I like the element of a contract farmer uh, that's one, but an organized contract uh, farmer uh, with uh, a potential buyer. I think I've, I know of some cases that have been successful. Now, on the issue of land consolidation, the problem I think we have is that we have very many small producers on land, uh, highly unskilled for most of them. If you, we went for land consolidation, where will these thousands and uh, thousands of people go? Uh, they may be compensated for, for their land, but what we've seen in Uganda is that they walk into urban areas and uh, join the, the army of the unemployed. So it would have been better to have land consolidation if these people can find alternative employment in urban and peri-urban areas, as opposed to moving into the services sector, um, very informal services sector, and misusing most of the money they have obtained from the sale of land. Thanks very much. Um, Interesting and again a complicated area. Jacob Otim, are are you are you online and you have a you had a hand up? I want to be sure to come to you if you're if you're still there. Uh, I think your my major concern is uh, what uh, a certain gentleman talked about the role of institutions. Africa has failed to perform basically because of weak institutions and corruption which basically makes every policy almost fails to materialize. In Uganda, I'm from Uganda, we have good policies, but it's always bedeviled by corruption. So institution does not function. And I think Africa needs to work on institution first, and then some of these policies will come to order. Thank you. Um, I, I, the sequencing proposed, first of all, working on institutions and then the others will follow. I, I, I think it is also too risky. Uh, let us take a, a multi-pronged approach. Uh, issues of institutions, getting the politics right will take some time. But let us not sort out each and everything related with institutions before we address the distortions. I think East Asia started. Uh, they had their challenges in uh, 
governance and institutions, but they were able to make progress. That would be my view. Uh, thanks for that. Richard Rogerson, um, you're up next, I think. Okay. Uh, thanks, Doug. Uh, thank you very much for the presentation. In the presentation, you mentioned uh, relatively high labor costs in Africa, and I just wanted to ask you to kind of talk a bit more about what you think the drivers of that are, uh, uh, what to do about it, et cetera. So just kind of open-ended to get you to talk more about that. Um, the one is uh, the quality, uh, the quality of, uh, of labor that uh, uh, you end up getting uh, in a number of uh, these countries. And uh, it all adds up to, to these costs. And when you talk to the business people, um, they always point out the issues of uh, the skills, the quality. And one of the things that we, we need to do as, uh, as Africa, which may not necessarily reduce actually the cost, but at least we need to do a lot of the skilling of, uh, of this labor so that the productivity can become higher from uh, the same level of labor units that uh, you are using. Um, and I, that would help, skilling of, uh, of the labor, that's what I can think of. Do you wanna follow that up, Richard? Yeah, I guess I would just, uh, it sounds, one thing is the cost of of a particular unit of unskilled labor. And the second, a different issue is the lack of skills. And it sounds like you're now saying the problem is more a lack of skills than the price per se. I mean. May I say it is both and they are related? Uh, sure. Obviously, if there's a shortage of skills, that will affect the price of those um, skills. But I guess you're, you're contrasting the situation in Africa with, you know, situation in several East Asian countries going years back. And you're, you're saying that comparison, the uh, Africa today has a skill shortage relative to countries in Asia 30 or 35 years ago? Uh, okay, that is one. But the other issue I think I've mentioned is the cost for that unit of, of, of labor. So it is the skills, yes, and the cost. Uh, the literature that I have read on this particular issue is that uh, um, as for some of the countries in Asia, the labor unit costs at the same level of development were lower than what you get in Africa. Let me, let me I'm, I'm conscious of time here and we're gonna to try to take a break before the next session. Can I ask you one further question? And this is one that my colleague Joe Kaboski posed um, in the chat, but I think he asked me to, to put it to you instead. Um, as I think he's on a call. Um, if you were to move from your role as a policy focused person to think about what we as researchers might plausibly do, what do you think are the key areas where academic research might be of some benefit to policymakers? Is there, is there some set of research questions where you think the evidence needs are great and where you think the, the academics in this audience might usefully provide some input into the policy discussion? I think um, um, the issue of uh, structural adjustment policies that have been implemented by uh, a number of uh, countries and the failure of those policies to be a source of structural transformation in Africa. I think that is something that we need uh, to look at. So that's one. 
The second one that I think needs to be looked into is what will it take to have industrial policies in Africa uh, and maybe relate it with uh, uh, the whole issue of regionalism uh, as a, a way of promoting uh, manufactured uh, exports. My third issue is the one of the financial sector. I think we need to understand better the functioning of, uh, of the financial sector so that it can be a source of uh, medium long-term financing uh, for the private sector. Thank you so very much. I think on, on that note, we should probably, we've taken quite a lot of your time I want to thank you, Dr. Kasakende. Uh, I wonder if in, in a deviation from what often happens on Zoom calls, I wonder if those in the audience who are able could actually unmute themselves and we can give you an actual out loud round of applause. Um, so please join me in, in applauding Dr. Kasakende. Uh, it's the... It's, it's thank the you. Can actually do to reproduce the experience. And yeah, I have, thanks a lot for the invite. There, there are a few more questions that came up in the chat. What I'd like to do, if you don't mind, is to digest those and send them to you in an email. And perhaps we can post that uh, along with some of the other Q&A on the website to go, with the, to go with the conference, if you're able to. But again, my, my deep appreciation and sincere thanks and uh, and Again, we're very grateful. So at this point, I think we will conclude the session. We'll take a short break and we'll reconvene at half past the hour. And uh, I hope to see many of you, all of you at the next session. Thanks very much. Thank you. So just to be clear, we have a proper break at this point. We have, I guess, um, about, what is it, five minutes? Um, I'm losing track of time here. We have five minutes, perhaps a little over, because I don't know that Joe and I need uh, 15 minutes for the program update. But please, uh, let's take this time. Good moment to have your um your beverage of choice, or at least uh, one that's appropriate for a continuing conference. And we'll see you back here in a couple of minutes. Joe and I are gonna talk, just to be clear, we're gonna talk a little bit about um, some upcoming calendar items and a little bit about the state of where we stand on STEG. And we also thought we'd talk a little bit about um, funding criteria and what we're looking for in proposals. So if you're considering submitting a proposal, or just wanna hear some thoughts on, on what we've been able to fund, what we'd like to fund, um, please please check back in. So that's what we'll do for about 15 minutes starting, starting a little while. And uh, then we'll move to the last paper session. Thanks very much. Great, well, I suspect we should pick back up and um, Joe and I are, apparently due to give a program update. And so there are a couple of things we'd like to do. I think we'd like to talk a little bit about some upcoming events on the STEG calendar and to make sure that people know some of the things you can look forward to. So I think I'll do a little bit of that and then maybe turn things over to Joe as um, who's, who's been leading the commissioning process to talk a little bit about what we've been funding and. Um, perhaps to give some headline numbers on, on where STEG sits. Um, as you know, I, I hope we're just about to begin the third year and the second, the second full year of the STEG program. Our first, the program kicked off on the 1st of March in 2020 at a remarkably inopportune moment. Um, our first year was an inception year 
when we had initially hoped to spend a lot of time traveling around to talk to policymakers, particularly in sub-Saharan Africa. That wasn't really possible given the pandemic, but we spent the first year trying to shape and rethink the STEG research agenda. There's a set of reports that came out of that, a set of background papers that are available. And then last year, um, in the second year, first proper year of the program, we moved fully into the commissioning phase of the program. And we began the process of issuing calls for proposals. And, um, and so competitive calls through a process that has led, let's see if I've got the numbers here. Um, roughly speaking, we've awarded, we've done two rounds of small research grant funding. We've now funded 32 small research grant projects another 10 PhD grants, um, eight larger research grants, and a handful of these, um, a handful of these ideas for transformation grants. So thus far, the program has awarded on the order of a million and a half pounds of research funding. There's a considerable amount more where that comes from. Um, over the next couple of years, we're going to be continuing to run calls. I think the next year we've got, we, as I've mentioned, we have a large research grant call open now, and we expect to be um, opening up several additional calls for small research grants in the months ahead. So please stay tuned on that. Um, do have a look at the website. Make sure that you're on the mailing list and getting the newsletter. So you'll be hearing about those in due course. I want to put in a couple of plugs for some STEG related or STEG, um, STEG spin off activities that might be of real interest to the group here as well. STEG is uh, one of the co sponsors for an online open access free course on African economic history that's being organized by the London Business School's Wheeler Institute for, for Business and Development. Um, and has a fantastic um, all-star cast of lecturers and presenters. It's been widely advertised. I'm going to put a link in the chat that you can see um, who's involved in that, but Steg's very proud to be a co-sponsor of that, and we think that the links between African economic history and the structural transformation agenda are, are ones that might be of real interest to this audience. Um, in addition, there's, I, I wanna um, put in a plug for a fantastic program workshop that, um, that Alessio Moro has organized at the University of Calgary uh, on May 30th and 31st that will be streamed online. The ninth workshop on structural transformation and macroeconomic dynamics, which STEG is also co-sponsoring. We're really pleased to partner with that long running conference um, and just delighted to be a part of it. Um, I'll mention also very briefly that STEG is going to be organizing a, a I guess we, we're a, a set of STEG, um, STEG connected people will be delivering a capacity building course through the IMF um, for their an internal capacity building course. Um, and we very much hope that we will be able to make available, we expect to make available the lecture materials from that online um, as, as soon as we're able. So that's going on, uh, I guess, at the end of this month and beginning of next month. So you can look for those materials. We're not trying to reproduce the, the online course that Steg led a year ago. And um, we figure it's worth waiting another year and we'll have some new material and, and perhaps we'll, we'll try to have a reprise of that in, in uh, another year's time. Just to say there is no, um, to be a part of the network, there, there is no network. You're all part of it. Anybody, it's, it's a, STEG is an entirely open community. We welcome anyone to get involved. All you need to do is get yourself on the mailing list. Um, if send an email to the, through the STEG website, um, always welcome to drop me a line and we'll make sure that if you want to be involved in and to hear about what's going on within STEG, um, 
we we will certainly do that. Um, I will. I see Cynthia's got a note asking to put a link for the Cagliari workshop. I will put that in unless somebody beats me to it. Um, I don't know how much is yet up on the website, but um, but we'll try to make sure to get that information out to people. I think on that note, maybe what I should do next is turn this over to Joe to talk a little bit about the, the commissioning process and uh, how we've thought about what we're looking for in, in funding different proposals. Um, it's been a, a learning process, I think, for all of us. And But as we've gotten partway through, I think there's increasing clarity in what we're looking for in the different types of projects that we fund. It's, it's not a monolithic and it's not a mono method program. So it's there's quite a diversity of things. But Joe, why don't you pick this up here? Thanks, Doug. And uh, Doug, feel free to chime in uh, if I, I missed something and if you think of something. Um, so uh, we have um, four vehicles for funding. We've gone through multiple rounds. Doug, you already kind of updated them on, the, on that. Is that right? Very briefly, yes. So we've had multiple rounds. The four vehicles we have are the small research grants, which are uh, up to 20,000 uh, pounds over the course of a year. Um, the large research grants, which can go up to 100,000 pounds over the course of two years. Um, the PhD grants, which are limited at 15,000 uh, pounds, and those are for a year. And then what's called the I4T, uh, the ideas for transformation. And I'll talk about those last. They're kind of in a, a little bit of an, in a class by themselves. So um, the review processes for these grants are, are different, but basically we send them out to reviewers or who have a review panel, uh, as you might expect. I think I want to stress a little bit of the criteria. The first of all, the application, pro I would just want to encourage you all, if you have ideas to, to apply, I don't think the application process is overly tedious, but I want to give you a little bit of a sense of what we're looking for and uh, kind of where, what we're having maybe more challenges uh, filling. The first thing I wanted to say is that, you know, the emphasis of STEG is these macro development questions surrounding structural transformation and economic growth. As the conference has uh, exemplified, we're open to various methods. Uh, so it, while the questions are really macroeconomic questions, uh, the, it stretches out across uh, many different fields and many different methodologies. And so it's not, we, don't, we want more than just simple macroeconomists um, addressing these questions. Uh, the second thing is that the focus is really on uh, improving uh, making academic research that can inform and improve macro development policy for low income countries. Uh, so there's kind of two points that maybe distinguishes it uh, from other research programs, three points. One is against the, the macro question. Uh, the we, we disproportionately want to fund things that wouldn't otherwise be funded by other sources like JPAL and PEDAL or, or the IGC. Um, but the other parts are the policy relevance. So we really want you to emphasize how your research is going to uh, help or feed into improvement of policy. And the second is for low-income countries. And so there's a bit of a challenge because low-income countries often have you know, the least data available to do analyses. It's an overlooked area uh, in terms of publishing for, for the field. Um, but you're, if you're doing something on a low-income country, your chances of getting funded are markedly improved. If you're doing something on a middle-income country, even a middle-income country, a Latin American country, uh, or, you know, you have to make a strong argument for how what you're doing is going to be informing policies for low-income countries and, and why this particular setting is needed or is ideal for answering that question. Um, so again, emphasizing the policy. 
It's not just policy relevance. If you have an opportunity to actually impact policy because you are working in conjunction with a government agency or somebody located in a low income country, uh, that's all the better because we really do want to impact policy. Uh, of course, the, the, the primary output is academic research, but I don't want you to think that you have to be able to get a top five publication to get funded. That's really not what we're, uh, that's not the, the bar that we're setting. Uh, if you're gonna produce a, a quality publication and it's uh, in the areas and topics um, that we're, that you know, we emphasize, I would encourage you to apply. Um, we have rolling rounds and we're able to fund a great deal of projects. So I think your odds are not negligible. Uh, if you're located in a, uh, a low income country, I wanna especially encourage you to apply. I also wanna especially encourage you to potentially uh, look for ways, and this is for everybody, no matter what country you are, to collaborating um, across disciplines, across countries, et cetera, uh, to produce really a top quality research that's gonna be relevant to low income countries. Um, that leads to the I4T. And I think the I4T is the hardest one to sort of know what we're expecting. I4T means ideas for transformation. These are very short papers. They're not research papers that are meant for publication. They're more like concept papers about policies in low-income countries, potentially low-hanging fruit. So something in the mezzo level. Uh, doesn't, it's not uh, coming up with a new exchange rate regime at the macro level. It's not doing an RCT uh, using cameras for teachers to, to show up at school, but maybe it's uh, you know, a particular industry or something that would have a sizable impact on an economy. There's an area that you know, might grow or something. Uh, looking for a, fric a potential friction that inhibits growth, a, uh, a, a policy that might change it. Um, and this is kind of a grassroots way of coming up with policies that might be uh, important in the policy circle where academic research might be informative and hopefully fostering some even collaboration among researchers so that the academic community is really informed about what the policy questions of relevance are in low income countries. So these are concept papers. You get paid a thousand pounds to write them. It's a couple of pages of explaining what the issue is and, and, and why it might be relevant and how it might be a, a, evaluated. Uh, you know, lastly, we are looking for ways and, you know, Zoom is great for many things. Uh, we can get people from around the world connecting like we are today, but it's really bad for fostering collaboration. And we are looking for ways of bringing researchers um, to developing countries, bringing policymakers from or, or, or academics in developing countries uh, to our conferences to engage with researchers from the rest of the world and hopefully foster collaborations. We, Doug and I are really looking forward to things going in person. Uh, at some point, we just have to bite the bullet and, and you know, uh, fund some in-person in things, and I think that'll help on that front. But if you have other ideas about workshops that we might be able to put together, et cetera, uh, please share them with us. Doug, anything to add there? No, I would just say we're, we're particularly keen to build the field, to expand, to bring people in who who might not uh, necessarily feel that they're well plugged into other academic networks, and so we're really we're really um, looking for that kind of engagement. I think we probably ought to move on. We took more time than I expected, so rather than doing Q and A now, may I just say that if anybody has questions around funding, around what Steg is doing, or where we're going, please send an email to me or to Joe, or just send an email to the to the general Steg uh, email address, which um, I'll stick in the chat, but uh, we look forward to hearing from you. We're just really excited about where the program is and what lies ahead. And without maybe without further ado, what I would like to do at this point is to turn the floor over to Michelle Tertilt, who's gonna chair the final session. We have two fantastic papers so thanks to everyone for sticking around this far, but please do stick around a little bit longer. Um, we've got 
great stuff ahead. So Michelle, I'm going to turn the floor over to you. Thanks. Yeah, I'm very excited to be chairing this final exciting session. Um, just the ground rules, I guess everyone knows about 40 minute talk, 20 minute q and I don't know, are there any co-authors in the, in the call here? Uh, I mean, in the conference um, of Callum, um, because oh, then I you can- have, I don't have any co-authors. Oh, so. I'm sorry. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, so please write the questions in the chat. I mean, other people and I will, you know, organize them and, you know, come back to them in the Q&A. Um, yeah, but don't expect written answers during the talk. Okay, so Callum will be talking about foreign aid and structural change. So the floor is yours. Thank you. I'll just do the screen sharing. Um, is that working okay? So, sorry, Michelle, could you just give me a thumbs up? It's, it's working fine, it's Callum. Fine. Great. Uh, so thank you very much for this opportunity to present my paper, Foreign Aid and Structural Change. I'm uh, very grateful to present it, particularly at this conference. I can't think of anywhere better to present this paper, especially considering so many of the researchers in this room I admire greatly and uh, many of them are cited in this paper. So the title is Foreign Aid and Structural Change, uh, and I'll cut right to the chase. I investigated how foreign aid inflows has contributed to structural change in sub-Saharan Africa. And I found that Chinese aid is more conducive for developing country industrialization than conventional development assistance committee aid. That's the DAC aid, that's aid from uh, Western countries and developed Asian countries, Europe, America, Japan, Korea. Um, I also found that DAC aid has reduced the manufacturing share of employment in sub-Saharan African countries and uh, possibly also value added, whereas Chinese aid may have increased it. So opposite effects there. Uh, and also that these results hold at least qualitatively at the sub-national regional level. So here's what I will do today. I will continue with this introduction and provide a bit of a roadmap to the paper because it's a big beast and I think it needs a bit of structure so I don't get lost and so you don't get lost too. I then uh, provide a bit of background theory and some uh, stories uh, which motivate the uh, paper and then talk about some heterogeneities uh, before presenting the three hypotheses which are developed on the basis of all this background and theory. I then take some time to talk about data, including some new data contributions and also some data sources which may be less familiar. Uh, then I'll talk about methodology, and this is also where I'll present the uh, new instrument sets that I'm using, uh, and then present all the results and conclude with uh, concluding remarks and uh, policy relevance. So the research question in full was how the DAC and Chinese aid flows affect the manufacturing and agricultural shares of the economies of sub-Saharan Africa and are these effects heterogeneous across the two aid types? Do these effects also hold at the sub-national level? So I call the paper foreign aid and structural change. The focus of what's in the paper is the effects on manufacturing and agriculture. I did look at effects on other sectors too and are most cases found null results. Null results, for example, are the effects of aid on the public sector, which might be a bit surprising considering some past work, and null effects of the effects of aid on uh, services, or at least traded, so at least our, our retail services. Um, and null effects are interesting, of course, as well, but I had to limit how much went in the paper. So I focus on agriculture manufacturing. I use the economic transformation database. I uh, supplement it with some subnational data, which I construct for this project. The sample periods are different. Uh, this is due to the data availability of Chinese aid. In all cases, I choose to uh, run analysis on the largest possible sample for each uh, specification given the data availability. So I explore these effects of aid on the relative size of the economic sectors across three sources of heterogeneity. Uh, first, the different donors, the DAC aid versus the Chinese aid. Uh, you might say, why also not consider it between different DAC donors, like the uh, difference between, for example, USA and Japanese aid. But all this aid does tend to be funneled through the Development Assistance Committee, which implies which it applies some standardized uh, framing and regulation. So there is less difference, I think, between the effects of these types of aid and between the aid with, of China, which is a very different beast. China has and is not and has never been a member of the Development Assistance Committee, and there are some tensions between the two. 
I also look at the effects across different levels of aggregation, the effects at the country level, and the effects on subnational regions. Those are administrative regions such as provinces, federal states, etc. And I look across different sector concepts. So persons employed and value added, uh, that distinction will be very familiar to this audience. So to recap again, we go from the effect of aid on the sector share via mechanisms, which I, I don't include a mechanism analysis in the paper, but discuss the mechanisms from our past papers, are through to national level work and subnational level work. Each of these are geographical levels of heterogeneity, uh, then are performed on both DAC aid and Chinese aid using for national level data the ETD, subnational level my new SETD, uh, and at the national level I use uh, IV to SLS as my preferred specification. At the subnational level my instruments were not strong enough, so that's panel fixed effects is the best specification I have there. Us literature linking foreign aid and structural change is surprisingly little, at least in my view, considering how large the aid of effectiveness literature is and how many different papers there have been on aid effects. Um, but there is the famous paper of Rajan and Subramian, uh, which talks about aid and the Dutch disease mechanism. I'll talk more about that on the next slide is our uh, mechanisms analysis. And it uh, found a negative impact of aid on uh, the relative size of tradable manufacturers in terms of VA. Uh, and then also a GMM paper of Arellano et al. Uh, found that aid negatively affected the manufacturing share of exports. Uh, the closest to maybe to what I'm doing is Saleya and Thiel's uh, GMM work on the impact of aid on value added. Here they're looking directly at the effect of aid on the relative sizes of broad sectors as I'm doing. Uh, and they find a positive impact on what they call tradables, combined agriculture and manufacturing, and services, uh, both. The downside of this is that so much of our structural change literature in theory involves movements from agriculture to manufacturing and the separate consideration of the two. So having the two aggregated unfortunately doesn't inform a lot of the structural change research questions that we're interested in quite so much. Page 2012 addressed this question in a very descriptive way, uh, and he presented a lot of descriptive evidence and uh, reference to a lot of policy reports as well, arguing that the DAC aid and conventional aid was not prioritizing industry, and uh, he expressed the expectation that it was not conducive to industrialization. There's also a micro level study by RLUP 2019, uh, which suggests that in Uganda, aid flows at the individual level cause people to allocate more time to agriculture. And he attributed this to uh, aid being providing products like mosquito nets, uh, tents, housing materials and things which were pushing out local manufacturers and local suppliers. Why do we care about the effect of industrialization? Well, the African deindustrialization in the literature or industrialization uh, has been on the radar of uh, many people in the structural change world for a long time. And I think it's fair to say there's a lot of concern over the recent state of industrialization in sub-Saharan Africa. We've heard of premature deindustrialization. We've heard about the failure of manufacturing to take off in many countries. We've heard about growth reducing structural change where employees have been allocate, reallocating in the wrong direction from productive manufacturing to less productive sectors. And there have been various explanations posited for this, uh, policy-based explanations, lack of government of support, uh, globalization and competition, rent seeking and corruption, papers have you know, empirically tested various drivers of structural change and looked at their uh, relative contributions through specific factor analysis. But what is often missing is sort of international policy or at least international development policy. And of course, the biggest arm of international development policy, at least in terms of cash numbers, is foreign aid flows. So uh, we talk perhaps about uh, policies within developing countries and policies which developing countries are advised to undertake, but we're often not talking so much about the perhaps, you know, shocks or exogenous effects by these big aid flows and other inflows that come as a result of international development policy. So that's where I feel a little bit of a gap here and uh, look at this as perhaps another potential driver of structural change in addition to uh, structural change as a result of uh, impact and side effect of aid flows. A uh, recent paper has shown more positive story in the last decade with uh, Cruz et al. 2021, charting a renaissance in our uh, manufacturing in the most recent decade, or a naissance in the country, of, in the case of countries which didn't really get started with manufacturing to begin with. 
This is just one way of showing this phenomenon. There are many different ways in many different papers, but I've just taken the ETD data, uh, averaged it across countries and show it over time with a weighted average by the total size of the country's economy. And uh, left-hand side, you see employment, manufacturing share of employment, right-hand side, manufacturing share of constant value added. And we see in both cases, uh, at least no real upward trends until 2010 and a big downward trend, at least in the 90s. And this is the uh, essence of uh, the industry industrialization and then only from 2010 onwards do we see the shoots of what might be considered the uh, renaissance but uh, there are many other ways of showing this you may not uh, particularly like the weighted average approach but you all know papers which have shown African deindustrialization in different ways and uh, this just shows that it holds in the sample that I'm doing and with the ETP and uh, also in the case of current price value added. Why do we care again? Well because of our uh, the differential in uh, sectoral labor productivity. I think this style of graph, at least I first saw it in Macmillan and Hartgen, but I reproduce it for the uh, ETD, where we have the bars, uh, the width of the bars is the average share of the total labor force of each sector. The height of them is the productivity, the average productivity in those sectors uh, for the economic transformation database. What we see is that agriculture is very, very below average in terms of average productivity, but by far the largest in terms of the number of people. What we also see, I don't know if you can see my pointer, but I'm hovering over the kind of tealy uh, manufacturing block, which is the above average in terms of its average productivity. And whilst it's not the most productive sector, it's almost the most productive of the big sectors. It's the most productive of the sectors that you can realistically see unskilled labor being reallocated into. So also within the ETD, we are uh, have this uh, notion that if workers are being pushed out of manufacturing, so long as they're moving anywhere leftwards along that uh, graph, we might be in the territory of growth reducing structural change as a result of aid flow. So let's talk about the bus theory of mechanisms which might link aid and structural change. Well, most commonly talked about is aid as a form of Dutch disease. That is, uh, aid, aff aid affecting, a well, the Dutch disease traditionally talks about large uh, resource rent inflows from natural resources, but it's just as applicable to foreign aid. Uh, and it, when there are large inflows of uh, foreign capital coming from outside of the economy, uh, and as these are used very productively, they often inflate the real exchange rate and, uh, you know, at the same time as causing rent extraction, which means people are shifting within the country more to importing their manufacturers and they're spending more uh, locally on non-tradable. So we depress the local manufacturing sector. And uh, Roderick 2008 actually explicitly speculated that this might be one of the reasons why we often find disappointing effects of aid on growth. Dow and Macmillan 2018 extend the Lewis model to uh, uh, incorporate this effect too in a very nice way. So that's also, that's the sort of theoretical model for it. Uh, perhaps key paper, uh, Golan et al. 2015's fantastic paper on consumption and production cities. Uh, they talk about, again, natural resource rents, but it's just as applicable to foreign aid. Uh, if aid, uh, there's urbanization, but there's different types of urbanization. There's uh, manufacturing or productive urbanization, and there's uh, non-tradable urbanization which facilitates consumption. So if aid is facilitating consumption rather than uh, production and productivity, then what we might see is this concentration of wealth causing people to uh, uh, move more and more into non-tradable services in order to provide services for this newly concentrated wealth whilst the manufactured goods are imported on more favorable, ter favorable terms because of this real exchange rate appreciation. I also showed in a previous paper with co-authors that aid, uh, DAC aid, negatively impacts urbanization. Uh, so it, to the extent that manufacturing takes place in urban settings, if aid is uh, causing urban to rural migration, then it's also likely to have a negative effect on manufacturing. On the alternative direction, you might expect that aid could boost manufacturing if aid was spent on productive resources. And uh, that might be aid as a driver of infrastructure or being set bent on uh, or coming with knowledge sharing or technical knowledge or allowing countries to get closer to the technological frontier of the donors. Uh, and then we might see the other way around. But as I will show, this likely applies more to Chinese aid than it does to uh, DAC aid, because it does tend to be spent more on this kind of project. Let's look at the differences between these two types of aid. Well, here are the correlations between on the uh, 
uh, x-axis the uh, aid flows and on the right axis, sorry, the annual aid flows, I should have said, and on the uh, y-axis, the manufacturing share, uh, top panel employment, bottom panel constant value added, left-hand side, uh, traditional DAC aid, right-hand side Chinese aid. Now, these are even more useless than normal in terms of telling us anything about causality, because of course, aid effectiveness is plagued with reverse causality issues, but it does tell us one thing which is very important, and that, that it's whatever way you cut it, there's something clearly very different about traditional DAC aid and Chinese aid. Either DAC aid is being targeted differently than Chinese aid, in that it's being targeted towards less industrialized countries, whereas Chinese aid is not, or DAC aid is causing deindustrialization in a way that Chinese aid is not, or most likely some combination of the two. But there is heterogeneity between the two types of aid. And we know from the literature that they're different in character. Chinese aid is less conditional, usually, than the AC aid. It's more prone to political capture uh, and often for reasons of political economy. Therefore, it's allocated where there are large concentrations of voters in urban areas and on projects which are popular with voters, such as infrastructure. Um, also, uh, it's been shown by people in the uh, political science sphere that China uses aid a lot for excess labor and production shedding, which also show, lends itself to this kind of infrastructure development, which might be pro-industrialization. I also showed that DAC and Chinese aid had opposite effects on at least one important variable, urbanization rates in a previous paper. Also talking of heterogeneity, there is the existence of this micro macro paradox in aid effectiveness research, where so often uh, aid interventions are shown to help the individuals that they are uh, intervene on in micro level studies, but macro level studies are often fail to find uh, large scale growth effects, or if they do find these effects, they're highly conditional on institutional factors and generally exactly the kind of factors which are not there in the countries that we would most want to help with aid. Um, and a large part of the reasoning for this is perhaps that uh, aid is fungible with government spending, uh, so uh, it crowds out government spending. Um, and for this reason, I, I don't have, I'm not doing a micro level study, but I see the necessity of taking us down an aggregation below country level, because if we look at regions, well, then we still don't lose the kind of general equilibrium effects that we lose in these micro level interventions and so still capture some of that fungibility but we do see whether these uh, results hold or become more or less clear once you drop down an aggregation and once you work on smaller spatial units where reallocations may occur more quickly so for that reason i see the regional analysis is far more than just a robustness check so on the basis of these i developed three hypotheses uh, and then I honorably didn't change the second one when it didn't completely come out true. Uh, uh, the first hypothesis is that that aid has caused the industrialization in the uh, in sub-Saharan Africa, particularly in uh, terms of employment, uh, because of this real exchange rate effect, because no evidence of that aid being used to uh, foster productive, uh, productive as a, used as a productive resource and because of the explicit rural targeting of decade in recent years. There's no reason to expect that, I didn't expect this effect of Chinese aid because of its much uh, greater focus on industrial supporting uh, uh, infrastructure and other such projects and also because of the uh, political economy mechanisms of the type I talked about before. However, it still also could have this real exchange rate effect and uh, also uh, perhaps is even more prone to rent extraction because of its lack of conditionality. So for that reason, I thought these effects may balance out to null effects. And also I expect similar results at the subnational level because I expect that the subnational level will still be capture these general equilibrium effects, but that re reallocation may occur more quickly across smaller spatial units. So let's look at the data that I'm using. Well, the uh, dependent variable data, which are these uh, industry shares, all comes from the New Economic Transformation Database. Uh, I am one of the et al, in the Vries et al. Uh, the aid data comes from the OECD, uh, and uh, that's the national level aid data, and uh, the subnational level aid data and the Chinese aid data comes from these uh, project databases from the uh, aid data lab of William and Mary University. I'll talk more about the Chinese aid data on the next slide. Uh, in the controls, I include previously established theoretical drivers of structural change where possible using proxies similar to those uh, 
for which there is a precedent. This both allows me to benchmark or allows us to benchmark at least the magnitude and significance of aid effects compared to the effects of other drivers and also shows that these aid effects are there are uh, ceteris paribus of other drivers of structural change. Uh, and the instrument is based on natural disasters data uh, in which is taken from the emergency events database of the University of Louvain. So moment on the Chinese data, Chinese data is not from the official Chinese government sources. It comes from this geocoded global Chinese official finance data set by Dreyer, Axel Dreyer and his research team at William and Mary University. And these guys are, at least in the version I'm using, there's an even larger new version now, compiled almost three and a half thousand unique Chinese development projects where they were individually verified A, that the project actually took place and B, what the actual flow of money was. So preempting a couple of questions here, these are projects which have been individually verified by the aid data lab researchers. This is not the very controversial official Chinese aid statistics. And secondly, because it's very much on the individual geolocated project level, I'm able to filter by the types of aid and I'm able to filter it down to be only a ODA official development assistance equivalent aid. So I'm comparing, uh, I'm not comparing apples and oranges here. We're comparing uh, aid from China, which is equivalent to DAC aid, that is uh, direct grants, uh, soft loans or in-kind uh, gifts, not, uh, not investment Chinese FDI or investment masks as aid. So the downside of that is that my paper is completely silent on effects of Chinese investment in FDI, which is a large part of Chinese involvement in Africa, but, uh, the plus side of that is that uh, I do have this better comparability between the effects for decade and the effects for Chinese aid. So at least if not apples and oranges, uh, uh, you know, at worst, Granny Smith apples and Royal Gala apples. So in order to do the subnational analysis, uh, I needed subnational data. So I constructed it following similar principles as the economic transformation database. It's a sectoral employment data set for 122 different administrative regions, uh, that states or provinces across eight sub-Saharan African countries. Uh, it's just for employment. Uh, I think subnational sectoral BA for sub-Saharan Africa, but remains a bit of a holy grail at this stage. Uh, the sector disaggregation is exactly the same as the ETD in the same 12 sectors as is the sample period from 1990 to 2018. But unlike the ETD, I lean much more heavily on the benchmark years. So I construct uh, benchmark years from direct NSI micro data or detailed reports from labor force surveys or population censuses, or at worst case scenario, household surveys. Uh, and then I interpolate between the benchmark years using the national level trend. So in this data, all of the uh, inter-regional variation is driven by the benchmark years, although the inter-country variation is still there in every single year. There are also some obvious biases in this sample. It's biased towards the more developed sub-Saharan African countries and it's biased towards the Anglophone countries. That's quite simply because I had to dig pretty deep into NSI websites and into correspondence with people in the NSI and I'm not a French or Portuguese speaker, but I am uh, hoping to expand this data set to be a bit more representative. A very quick look at the national level summary statistics. Uh, I'm not going to spend much time on this at all because of time limitations. So the only thing I want, I, I divided it into, in half. The, first, the left hand side is for the first half of the sample. The right hand side is for the second half of the sample. Uh, I'm only going to look at the average aid flows at this point. Uh, you can see that uh, whilst the average uh, DAC aid flow is much larger in the country year. It's the ch average Chinese, it's, sorry, the Chinese aid flows are much more volatile. And actually the highest, the maximum aid flow in a given country year is higher for Chinese aid than it is for DAC aid. So whilst uh, DAC aid is much larger on average, Chinese aid is, is more volatile and can be very non-negligible. And, and in extremis can actually be much larger than uh, traditional DAC aid. So it's uh, definitely not uh, completely dwarf by the conventional aid. Now let's look at methodology. Well, we start with personal fixed effects as the benchmark, uh, where I regress the industry shares on transformed aid, either logarithmic transformation or inverse hyperbolic sign transformation. Either way, you get that partial elasticity interpretation on our coefficient of interest, which is beta one. For ease of exposition, I divide the control vector into two. The, 
uh, the, the controls which are previously established drivers of structural change um, and those other controls which I draw from the aid effectiveness literature which are only there to refine consistency and precision and uh, I, in the slides on this uh, to keep things short I'll only show the coefficient estimates from the previously established drivers because I think they're the only ones which are particularly interesting. The uh, IV is a panel fixed effects IV regression again of industry share on our transformed aid but now aid is instrumented by our these are uh, instruments which involve transformation or well which are created in the following way. Hey, can, you, can you quickly just tell us what the indexes were again I, J and K? Um, yes, so uh, we have uh, regions, uh, countries, and sectors, uh, are, I think, are, uh, are different. Uh, sorry, no, uh, countries would be I. Countries uh, I, okay. Yeah, yeah J, uh, sectors, and K, type, whether it's uh, VA or employment. Okay. My, my, my apologies. Uh, in the uh, regional analysis, I will be regions. Uh, I, I, and I will I, I will explain what this instrument is in detail. I promise. Uh, it exploits our uh, exogenous variation and the severity and severity and frequency of natural disasters occurring in the donor countries. So this is a supply side instrument. Uh, it, the exogenous variation comes from things happening in the donor countries because almost all forms of exogenous variation in recipient countries are going to affect how much aid goes to them and are going to violate the exclusion restriction. So the first stage relationship. Uh, comes from the fact that domestic natural disasters in donor countries affect the preferences of donor countries, citizens and policymakers for foreign aid, and also affect the amount of excess resources that they have for foreign disaster relief uh, because of the uh, resources that they have to expend on cleaning up disasters at home. Uh, you can imagine that if you have, for example, a very large typhoon in China that uh, both affects how much the uh, how the citizens and the government wish the aid budget to be prioritized and also how much aid budget there is to prioritize. Unfortunately, statistical methods are able to tell us whether these instruments are strong enough or not. Um, and the exclusion restriction uh, comes from the fact that national disasters, are, natural disasters occur randomly. They're not a controlled variable and they don't affect conditions in the recipient countries, the aid recipients, other than through the aid flows from the donor countries in which the disasters occur. And I'll discuss the inclusion restri exclusion restriction more in a minute. Uh, it should be noted that in, as Angus and Imbens showed us in a world of uh, heterogeneous IVs, what we are talking about here is a local average treatment effect, uh, the effect of the, those marginal products which projects which vary in response to the uh, instrument and uh, but um, I expect therefore that the late will be lower than the average treatment effect because you'd expect the weakest projects to be cut first and similarly uh, for the DACA where we have an index of natural disasters occurring across the DAC a variation is going to be driven more in aid flows from those countries which experience large numbers of natural disasters so uh, American and Japanese aid is going to weight more heavily than uh, German and Dutch aid. So I have intertemporal variation, but it's a panel IV, so I also need to introduce interrecipient variation. And I do this using the shift share methodology, which I think was first done by Nunn and Quinn, and then it's been utilized very effectively by Dreyer, well, first by Dreyer and Langlotz, and then by a series of papers on Chinese aid by Axel Dreyer and various co-authors, uh, where two sources of variation interacted, these intertemporal frequency and severity measures of natural disasters, interacted with probabilities of receiving Chinese aid on the basis of how of uh, the share of years in which there was a positive aid flow uh, for the case of Chinese aid or by the weights of the total uh, of the DAC total aid budget that goes to each recipient country in the case of DAC aid. So what this gives us is actually a form of continuous DID style uh, analysis where the uh, higher probability uh, countries are compared to the lower probability countries are uh, albeit only in the case of that variation, which is driven by the uh, exogenous change in natural disasters in the, in the uh, donor countries. In terms of exclusion violation, uh, exclusion restriction violations, uh, you could potentially see a violation if uh, a massive disaster spilled over even onto the continent of sub-Saharan Africa uh, or through effects of a national disasters in developing developed countries on world markets or world commodity markets uh, or also through the climate change mechanism. Now some would indeed argue that 
uh, because of the proven link between climate change and uh, natural disasters, that natural disasters are no longer completely randomly occurring. Uh, but um, there is not too much in that because uh, in order for that to be the case, it would have to affect not only the overall preponderance of national disasters, which I think is probably true, but their specific timing and their specific uh, 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 occurrence within this relatively short time period. And there's plenty of evidence to show that even in the pre-industrial era, there are a very large number of natural disasters in China and in the United States of America and in other uh, countries in the set. Uh, Similarly, uh, and also because I have multiple instrument sets for each uh, uh, question, uh, we can, you know, get some suggestive evidence from Sargon Hansen tests, uh, not uh, conclusive, of course, but uh, to the extent that those are useful, the Sargon Hansen test is passed in all cases, and I present the statistics. You could also think that maybe there is a natural disaster so big that it could spill over from the donor countries into the uh, uh, recipient countries, but I show here that even between the donor countries, the correlations between national disaster frequencies are not large in almost all cases below 0.5. So even if the correlation between national disasters is low, even between the geographically proximate donor countries, you can imagine that between the donor countries and the recipient countries, the uh, correlations between natural disasters are not that high at all, uh, which means that in general, I don't think that years with higher levels of natural disasters in the DAC countries are likely to also be associated with very high levels of natural disasters in the recipient countries. So having gone through all that, let's uh, look at the results. These are the results from the panel fixed effects regressions. I, I uh, focus on the second row, which is the effect, the lagged effect of aid uh, after four years. This is uh, as uh, Clemens et al. Uh, emphasize, because aid takes time to for its effects to realize, you know, often aid projects are attributed to the first announcement of the aid. So first the aid needs to flow and uh, then the effects need to take time to manifest themselves, particularly in terms of structural change where reallocation cannot happen overnight. Uh, that being said, I do also present the contemporaneous effect in the first line. Um, and uh, in these even number columns, you see the lagged effect, and in all three columns, you see a significant negative coefficient on the uh, of the lagged aid on the uh, manufacturing share of employment value added and constant value added. In terms of the other theoretical drivers of structural change, uh, well, at least in terms of this relative productivity term, which is, I should have perhaps specified, the uh, ratio of manufacturing to agricultural productivity, we see the expected signs and significances in many regressions. And in terms of the relative trade, which is the uh, ratio of uh, trading goods to services, we also see expected signs and significances. Uh, perhaps surprisingly, we don't see uh, significant results for uh, significant uh, on the income and population coefficients, uh, that might be also because I don't include the quadratic terms. Uh, for Chinese aid, they, uh, sorry, firstly, for the effect of, on the agricultural shares, we see positive coefficient, uh, even though these are larger in the shorter term than in the, uh, uh, in the lagged effect, and uh, they're perhaps less generally significant, but in all cases still the uh, coefficients have now turned uh, positive and are statistically significant in, in many cases. So from the panel fixed effects results, it's suggested of a deindustrialization effect and a pro-agriculturalization effect of uh, traditional development assistance committee aid. Uh, Chinese aid, uh, it does contain all the same controls. I just cut them down to fit them on one slide because obviously the uh, control coefficients don't change very much. Uh, we don't see much of the wave effects from these panel fixed effects regressions. Uh, small uh, positive coefficients, but almost unilaterally insignificant, uh, not unilaterally, almost ubiquitously insignificant on the uh, uh, manufacturing shares and uh, pretty noisy, uh, you know, irrelevant coefficients of the effects of the uh, agricultural shares. Now let's look at the uh, IB result. So the results from the preferred specifications. The top panel uh, is the effects of our uh, DAC aid uh, on the first three columns, manufacturing shares across employment value added and constant value added, and the second three columns, agricultural shares. The bottom panel is the effects of Chinese aid. Again, I show now only the fourth lags. I designed the instrument for the fourth lag. So this is, uh, it's uh, strong enough 
uh, only for these and not for me to show the contemporaneous effects. Uh, you can check the instrument strength with this line, the uh, KPF statistic, which is the appropriate statistic for panel fixed effects regressions. And now you see that this uh, negative significant coefficient of the lagged uh, decade flows on the manufacturing share of employment remains negative and significant and is actually increased in terms of economic magnitude. Uh, that being said, the uh, effects on uh, manufacturing value added and on agricultural shares have now turned uh, insignificant. Now the Chinese aid, uh, by contrast, we see a lot more significance here. We see now these positive effects of Chinese aid on uh, manufacturing have become both value added and employment have become considerably larger in terms of economic magnitude and now become statistically significant, albeit only at 10% in the case of value added. We also now see negative uh, coefficients on uh, agricultural employment and agricultural constant value added, although positive coefficient are on uh, current price value added, which is possibly an anomaly or possibly due to confounding price effects. Looking at the subnational level data, we see uh, the top panel, the uh, World Bank aid project. So the full OECD decade uh, data is not available at the subnational level. So I had to use a geolocated World Bank uh, aid data set, which means that I'm capturing only the World Bank aid, which is a subset of uh, DAC aid. It's not exactly the same, but it's the best I can do. And uh, once again, we see negative uh, coefficients, uh, statistically significant on the manufacturing share of employment, but this time only on the contemporaneous effect not on the uh, lagged effect. And from Chinese aid, we see a positive uh, statistically significant coefficient on the contemporaneous effect of uh, Chinese aid on the manufacturing share of employment. Uh, but we see that this uh, uh, now there's a significant negative effect on the lagged uh, uh, Chinese aid flows, which pretty much uh, reverses the positive effect that we saw in the uh, first year. So there seems to be quite a speedy uh, reversion in the case of the subnational data. This is likely due to the fact that often uh, at the subnational level, regions get only sort of eight, maybe one shot or, uh, or rather than consistently over time. And that might be a reason why the dissipation is more rapid. Let's benchmark these coefficients in terms of economic magnitude. Uh, so what this means is that a 10% increase in the flow of DAC aid is estimated to cause a 0.142 percentage point decrease in the relative size of the manufacturing share of employment after four years, South East Paribas, whereas a 10% increase in the flow of Chinese aid causes approximately 0.052 percentage point increase in that manufacturing share from the preferred IV specifications, smaller coefficients uh, if you uh, take it from the panel. Uh, fixed effects. That's equivalent to a 2.1% decrease in the manufacturing share in the average country year from the case of DAC aid and a 0.7% increase, percent increase in the case of the Chinese aid. Uh, and there's a back of the envelope benchmarking exercise, which is a, perhaps a limited use, but in the average country year, uh, in this sample, that would mean for each 10% increase in the flow of DAC aid, just under 14,000 workers were diverted away from manufacturing to other sectors. Now, uh, whether these um, economically meaningful effects is obviously subjective, but when making your subjective consideration, I ask you to bear in mind that the changes in aid flows are often much, much larger than 10%. It's not uncommon for aid to double or triple from one year to the next, particularly in response to specific policy changes or specific uh, incidents. Um, so obviously you can't extrapolate too far away from these point estimates when you're talking about increases in that size, but 10% uh, increases in aid flows that I'm talking about here really are very modest compared to what the volatility that we see in reality. So let's discuss these results. Uh, well, they represent a strong confirmation of hypothesis one, weak confirmation of hypothesis two and three, that is that uh, uh, possibly, uh, you know, my hypothesis about the effects of Chinese aid was overhedged and that uh, uh, we actually maybe do see a pro-industrialization effect of Chinese aid, at least on the basis of the panel IV regressions and on the basis of employment. Uh, we see that the regional effects uh, act in the same direction of the national effects and are also statistically significant, but they diffuse more quickly. And in the case of the Chinese aid, they reverse. Uh, this is suggestive. Uh, there's suggestive evidence, very suggestive, and the more I look at the results, perhaps the more unsuggestive I find it, but uh, 
suggestive evidence of displacement to agriculture. There's definitely no link proven that these are the same workers moving from uh, manufacturing to agriculture, but if they are, or if they are moving to any other of the less productive on aggregate sectors, this means that this is an effective aid of growth reducing structural change. So whilst aid may uh, have within sector productivity benefits and may cause increases in growth uh, from uh, within sector, uh, productivity gains, this is mitigated perhaps by growth reducing effects of between sector productivity losses. And it supports the findings of those other uh, foreign aid and structural change papers I mentioned before. In conclusion, DAC and Chinese aid have meaningful and meaningfully different causal effects on the structure of recipient country economies. And uh, this therefore structural, we have this simultaneous result that structural change might be a mechanism through which DAC aid has had disappointing effects on overall growth effects in the aid effectiveness literature. And it also might be a, a part of the explanation not claiming that it's the whole explanation, a part of the explanation for the poor industrial performance of several sub-Saharan African countries in the recent decades. Um, I can also say that it's unlikely that the pro-industrialization effect of Chinese aid mitigated the negative effect of the AC aid. Uh, and in one of the appendix, I discussed this issue in more detail and show that when you put them both in a regression, the uh, coefficients remain of the same signs and significance, but the uh, DAC aid effect dominates. Uh, the purpose of aid is, of course, subjective. Industrialization is only one and perhaps quite low priority, depending on your perspectives. And even overall, macroeconomic growth might be a fairly low priority, given your perspective. Uh, and of course, there are other ways to include productivity other than by boosting manufacturing. But in my view, uh, supporting industrialization more might go some way towards providing sustainable jobs for the surplus agricultural workers. You know, everyone in aid is very concerned and rightly concerned with the rural poor because they're often the most poor, or the most destitute and with the least opportunity. Uh, but this current approach seems to be more maybe uh, keeping them going in less productive agricultural labor rather than, uh, and a, a more pro industrialization effect may actually help them better and more sustainably in the long term by uh, looking at, by providing jobs in more productive sectors. Um, and because Chinese aid seems to have a more pro industrialization effect, or at least no anti industrialization effect, looking at the composition of Chinese aid and their priorities might uh, provide some guidance as to how it can be done. And there is evidence in the most recent pre pandemic years uh, that the policy conversation is indeed moving in this direction. In the, a few 2019 reports on aid and aid for trade and such like, uh, for the first time, I start to see more explicit focus of aid and industrialization. Uh, than uh, on some of the earlier reports that I've looked at. I see a question already, but I'm, I'm at the end. Uh, the presentation references are all on the working paper, which is linked to on the STEG program. I thank you very much for your time and attention, and I welcome any questions, uh, starting, I presume, with uh, Joe Gabaski. Okay, so thank you for a stimulating talk. Um, this stark difference between the Chinese and more traditional uh, aid seems very interesting to me. So we have a first question here from Louise Fox. Do you want to just say it yourself, turn on your microphone and ask the question? I think that's better than me reading it. Okay. Um, interesting paper, Callum, of course. And I'm not going to dispute the model, nor am I going to argue for DAC aid exactly. My question is, uh, it doesn't look like to me in the model you've incorporated the mode of financing. Um, the uh, mode of financing in China for Chinese aid is debt. Finance DAC aid is mostly grant finance. And this is going to have medium and long-term effects on growth and structural transformation. Mm -hmm. And so I'm just wondering um, how uh, that would uh, fit into your model. Uh, it's a very good point. Um, so what I can say is that I filter out all of the aid projects which are financed by debt at what you might consider market terms. So uh, whilst perhaps debt financing may weigh more heavily in the Chinese aid that I'm considering than grant financing as compared to the uh, DAC aid, I'm only considering soft debt financing and uh, not uh, market rate debt financing. So it still is a ODA equivalent. Uh, I, I agree with you that uh, a good extension of this analysis probably would be to, uh, you know, one of the 
yet another form of heterogeneity, which I think could very usefully be explored, would be this distinction between different aid types. Because another important element, you know, again, because I look at aid in terms of dollar values, also this Chinese aid database contains a lot of uh, aid projects which don't have a, do a dollar value because they involve, uh, you know, personnel going across and knowledge sharing and these kind of things. And these may also be expected to have different effects and they get missed by my dollar aggregation method of analysis. So uh, I totally accept your point. Uh, the one difficulty would be that unfortunately, at least uh, and with your background, you, you could actually guide me to where I could find it. Uh, I could do this kind of subdivision of aid types at, uh, uh, for Chinese aid, but uh, so, but certainly at the regional level, I don't find that data for the full uh, set of DAC aid, uh, which again makes it a bit more difficult for me to do that sort of comparison between the aid from the two sources. But thank you very much for pointing out this uh, important source of heterogeneity, which I don't include in my main results. So I don't see other questions right now, but I do have some. And then please others, you know, if you have there, questions. There's, there, there's a hand raised. Uh, well, there is by, a hand by, raised. Yeah. I, Oh, I don't see this. It's me here. Sorry. It's Joe. Okay. So Joe, go ahead. I thought I'd spare myself typing it out because it was, it was less of a question. I was trying to think through something. You, you presented the regional results Yes. and you had the contemporaneous, by the way, very impressive paper. I, I really liked the, it's a creative approach. It's obviously a lot of work gone into it. Very thoughtful analysis. It's, it's impressive and it's inspiring to have uh, young people working on these important questions. Um, but I'm maybe not you, quite as young as I look, but thank you. Well, new in the field, at least, right? <laughs> uh, so if you could go to the regional results, you found this contemporaneous result yeah. on the regions. And I started thinking, you know, if you talk with uh, countries that receive Chinese aid, the complaint is always that the Chinese don't hire anything local. They don't use any local labor. That might be the direct effect. Maybe there's some indirect effects. And I started wondering how much of that contemporaneous result could be the actual infrastructure investment that's going in, you know, as Louise mentioned. Um, but then, you know, you're using logs. So I thought the first thing is when you quantify this, it seems to me like you shouldn't be using the average. You should be using the average of the logs, which is going to be obviously much smaller because that's kind of the mean of the data that you're using. If you thought about it as a linearization around the center point of your data, I think you should be using the mean of the log. But anyway, then I started thinking maybe actually you should be running this stuff all in levels anyway, uh, mm -hmm. in the sense of trying to think about what's the direct impact and what are kind of spillovers. Um, I don't know if any of this stuff is helpful or if you've thought it, through it, this it, thing. It, so it, let, it, me, it is. Let, let me just, you can respond to that. Yes, I, I would like to. Thank you. Uh, so on the second point, I, I, I agree with you. Uh, and I should say that I carried out robustness checks where I look at, uh, instead of uh, the uh, log of aid flows, the aid flows normalized by the recipient country GDP per capita and the, uh, sorry, not GDP per capita, just overall GDP. And uh, the uh, results are substantially the same. Uh, so what I'm doing I am following a little bit the aid effectiveness literature conventions when I use logs and then, uh, you know, they tend either to, to, to do it that way or to do it through these normalizations. And I, I also, I, 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 the presentation I gave today was perhaps a little bit more with a structural change slant, uh, given this conference. I also try and uh, in the paper keep a, an aid effectiveness slant as well. And uh, there is quite some homogeneity between the forms of the models used in the uh, aid effectiveness literature, which is why I uh, try to fit in with that framework. But I do agree with you that looking at these uh, results in levels, particularly perhaps at the sub-national level, um, might illuminate more. And also uh, in terms of evolution, uh, my first decision when uh, constructing the sub-national data uh, to round in thousands of persons, as was also the case, uh, as was the case in the national level ETD, uh, may not have been optimal in retrospect, because uh, it means that, uh, you know, there are some of, for example, the regions of Botswana and things like that, where there are only a few thousand people total, or so, so only a few thousand workers total in some regions. And I, I think that that's a, another way that more nuance could be added to the Yeah, results. that's what I meant when you start, when you start, you, t you really should be taking the mean of the logs, which is going to be much yeah. lower, a much smaller... Yeah country so that 14,000 number is going to go down and it could really be a lot of it could just be the direct impact that, that, of that, 
that's a very fair point. Uh, but I, I also uh, don't want to put too much attention on that 14,000 number because it's a very limited use anyway. You know, that's the average country year from the entire sample period. It, it, it really doesn't show us much about, you know, which, which are the countries that these are. Uh, uh, these effects are actually taking place in. So I think the uh, 2.5%, sorry, 2.1% uh, decrease, decrease in the manufacturing share or uh, just under 0.2 of a percentage, sorry, 0.15 of a percentage point decrease in the manufacturing share are perhaps the more useful measures in terms of economic uh, magnitude. Um, but uh, I, I also like your point about the uh, speed of the diffusion of the effects at the subnational level. And I also fully agree that in part, this is probably no more than the direct results of the uh, uh, aid itself. Uh, also on these, uh, uh, in terms of, you know, because again, a, a large part of the motivation for uh, my previous paper, which looked at the effect of aid on urbanization was uh, uh, this explicit rural targeting of foreign aid projects. So if uh, there's, you know, money being suddenly given very specifically to rural farmers, it's not at all surprising that perhaps very short term, people come back from the cities or something to their family farms to take advantage of that, boost their uh, agricultural labor force and then go away again. Uh, and especially given the smallness of the size of those subnational level coefficients, uh, I think it's completely reasonable to say that those may not uh, be much more than the actual uh, direct effects of the aid, but then the direct effects of the aid are still part of the macroeconomy. Okay, thank you. Um, so let me ask a quick question. Of and course. I guess I see another hand raised, but mine is a, just a very detailed question about the specifications. So one is, um, since you show that both types of aid enter, I'm just wondering, wouldn't the more natural specification be to have them both in the same regression? I mean, it certainly it, would. It, and that's it, what I have. was just surprised why you picked this one. And then my second question is um, on the first stage on the instruments. Um, I'm surprised. So I'd like to learn more about sort of the first stage because I'm thinking for the more traditional Western aid, there are many, many different countries. So there might be, um, you know, whatever, a flooding in Germany, and then probably France and other countries pick up. And I'm wondering if that disaster even has any effect on the total aid flow. Um, and so I was wondering if you could, you know, do you have any results on the first stage or could you show us sort of how your instruments are even driving this? Um, Yes. So firstly, in re regards to your first point, yeah, he here is the table, at least for the panel of fixed effects, where we have both of the uh, DAC aid and the Chinese aid in the same specifications. Uh, and uh, you can see that the uh, signs and significance levels uh, of the coefficients hold uh, when this is done. Uh, I, I actually did this as part of an appendix, mainly to demonstrate that the uh, Chinese aid is not enough to mitigate fully the uh, DAC aid effects, particularly when you take into account that there are fewer uh, Chinese aid flow years than there are Chinese aid flow years. Uh, but I do agree that perhaps uh, this should be considered more centrally in terms of the specifications as well. But I can at least reassure you that the results survive the inclusion of uh, both types of aid effects. The, the, the reason I uh, isolated them uh, is because I did want to be able to talk about them in independently rather than in, uh, in uh, interaction with each other. Um, now, yes, to talk more about the first stage equation. So, uh, so there is also one other thing I can talk about which, which relates perhaps a little bit to what you said, which is these local average treatment effects. I may do that if there's still time. We, did, we yeah. do have two more questions, so maybe you can oh, answer this. Sure, point. yeah. So, yes, so um, I perhaps wrongly made the decision not to put the, the full first stage table and instead to rely on this uh, work and F statistics to prove the instrument strength. That's because I was trying not to have too many uh, regression tables. Uh, so what the DAC instrument does is it effectively creates a weighted average of the natural disasters. So uh, it's, uh, weight, it's the natural disasters in a single index, but weighted by the uh, dominance of those countries in as aid providers. So if there was a, uh, you know, if one if one country was picking up the slack uh, from the others, which I'm, which I'm not entirely sure would be the case based on the way that it seems that governments allocate their aid budgets. I haven't heard of many countries saying we're gonna increase our aid because this country has cut it. But if that were the case, that should be picked up in the way.
Yes. Uh, should one of us go ahead? Uh, Emmanuel is also. Uh, let me. Okay. Uh, sorry, I, I I forgot to unmute myself. I'm sorry. Right. Um, I may ask you again about this three-stage later, Callum. But let's of move course. on to the other questions. So Emmanuel Menza has had his hand up for a while. So please go ahead. Hi, Callum. Nice, Hi, nice people. <laughs> Yeah, but I, I was wondering, what is the proportion of grants in the Chinese aid? Because I suppose that in, in recent years, uh, the Chinese aid to Africa is in the form of butter, butter exchange, where Chinese give aid to African countries in return for natural resources. Mm. So if a large part of this um, aid that is coming from China is not grants, but it's in the form of this butter exchange, and I, I, I I, then I can see that natural resource or natural disasters in China may have less effect on, on um, how they, they spend because they need the natural resources to produce in, in China. The second question is, um, you said that the dark, dark aid has um, less effect on, on that has no effect on manufacturing. So, and I guess that that is channel may not be very important because um, from 1990, what we see that aid is generally decreasing to Africa is generally decreasing, but, and, and it increasingly becoming a small proportion of capital inflows. Mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, and remittances, other inflows like remittances are becoming increasingly important. So what, in, in other words, what channels or what mechanisms explain that, that, that result? Thank you. Y yes, I would really like to, uh take that set take more time on that second question with regards to the first question the uh again um so i'm able to reduce the chinese aid to uh DAC equivalent aid but i haven't done calculations in terms of the composition of that aid uh so i can't tell you now the uh share of that which is soft loans which is in kind uh, aid and which is uh uh, direct grant so so unfortunately i don't i don't have those numbers for you what, what i can say is that the the methodology through which the chinese aid uh database was constructed uh does at least take pains to avoid that kind of inclusion of those kind of transactional aid projects now of course it's very difficult to do so if the transaction is implicit or is a sort of backroom transaction but certainly when but when there's a direct uh uh flow from china in exchange for something coming back from uh, Africa, unless it's at very favorable terms to these African countries that would not be included as uh, ODA equivalent aid and would not be uh, part of this data. The second point I think is really interesting because yes, as you say, in the nineties, uh, aid was a big part of uh, the macro economies of many sub-Saharan African countries. And uh, now it is not in the case of many sub-Saharan African countries. However, there are still some countries for which aid is uh, a big part. And I wonder whether this might be contributing to results that you yourself have found. These are manufacturing, you know, if, if, I, if I, to some extent, shown that DAC aid might be uh, depressing or causing deindustrialization in sub-Saharan African countries, if you have shown that uh, there is this re renaissance in manufacturing in many uh, leading industrialization countries of uh, sub-Saharan Africa in exactly this time period when they've become less dependent on the ACA, that lends itself to some symbiosis to me. But where is there still relevance? There is still relevance because there are exactly those countries which you showed are not picking up the industrialization thus far are those countries which are receiving large shares of foreign aid still. And it would be very good if foreign aid has been having negative industrialization effects in the past on other countries, if the DAC take that into account when focusing on this admittedly smaller subset of countries which still are very much aid dependent and should be concerned that they might be stopping these last uh, industrialization laggards from taking off or contributing to them not taking off by uh, the uh, inadvertent deindustrialization side effect of these decade flaws. So we're running out of time here, but um, I think we start a couple of minutes late. So let's take the last question by Ahmed Azan quickly and please a quick answer and then we'll have to move on to the next paper. Thank you. Uh, actually, some of my questions have already been asked, but still to pick up on an earlier point. Uh, so Chinese trade in Asia is very different, right? I mean, mm -hmm. the sense of 
I mean, the OBOR and others, there are big questions about uh, debt and so on. I take it all that has been accounted for in the case of Africa being much more equivalent to uh, OECD aid or a DAC aid. But that said, as you mentioned, the, the lack of conditionality makes it more prone to rent seeking and mm -hmm. capture, right? So, yes. uh, so to what extent are you sort of uh, accounting for that? That and, and this is a longer term question. Maybe your four period mm -hmm. lag effect is not capturing that. So that's one question. Uh, so mm -hmm. my other question is, given the sort of focus and concentration of aid in some countries, I mean, mm -hmm. the question, the point that Joe raised, is looking at mean effects, uh, uh, capturing that particularly, should you look at something like quantile models, mm -hmm. uh, you know, something like that to capture the uh, concentration of aid? But the yes. results are very interesting. The DAC results by itself is interesting, right? Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, I, I think that uh, so. So the first point uh, regarding this uh, pro this risk of rent extraction and uh, co-option of Chinese aid uh, is, is, I think, uh, there. It's not explicitly taken account of by my work, except in the fact that it's part of the motivation why I expect uh, different uh, uh, results. What, what I can say is that past literature suggests that whilst this aid is more uh, co-optable than DAC aid, it's usually co-opted more for reasons of political economy than it is for reasons of self-enrichment. Uh, at least I'm just go going off a couple of papers here, which is that it's, uh, it is spent on public services, on, but it's spent uh, strategically on public services. Uh, that being said, I'm sure there is some uh, leakage and I would expect more leakage. Uh, and uh, I, I wanna make very clear that even though uh, on this particular question of uh, industrialization, I'm saying that maybe uh, uh, Chinese aid has been a bit more pro-industrialization than DAC aid. I'm in no way implying any kind of uh, superiority or preference for Chinese aid along other uh, directions. And, I'm, uh, and uh, I'm, I don't want this to be seen as uh, 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 me advocating a pure Chinese model of uh, aid disbursement. Um, your second question, I got so yeah, carried away. Quickly, the very first. quickly. You really I, I, have to move on. Yeah. Uh, I, I, maybe I will uh, ask you to, to write it or to send it to me and, and, and I'll uh, address. Oh, yes. It was about the need to incorporate these uh, quintile regressions and move away. Yes. I, again, so there is this, uh, you know, decades of aid effectiveness literature have perhaps over aggregated aid effects as I have done. I'm trying to fit in with that literary canon at the same time, I do appreciate the need to move beyond that. And uh, if, I, I, it's, if the paper is already so long, it's difficult to squeeze more things in, but certainly one thing I would like to try to squeeze in would be uh, something which allowed me to look at these effects uh, to split this average across with more nuance. And I thank you very much for the suggestion. Okay. Well, thanks again, Callum, for an interesting talk and all this, um, um, you know, thoughtful questions and discussion, um, but now we have to move on. So Kevin Donovan is gonna um, give the next talk. We'd like to thank you all for your questions and for a wonderful conference. Um, and so Kevin is gonna talk about labor market flows and development. So the floor is yours. Great, um, I think I need Callum to stop. Yeah, Callum, please stop sharing. There we go. Okay. Uh, you can see my slides and, and hear me okay? Great. Yes. Um, Todd, my co-author Todd was on the call. I'm not, I'm not sure if he's still here, um, but if nobody answers your question in the chat, obviously feel free, feel free to, to stop me. Um, so this is joint work with Will Liu and Todd Schulman. Um, it's about labor market flows. And I'll start with the usual disclaimer that this is not the official opinion of the Central Bank of Chile or, or the Fed. So we're motivated here by something that is at the heart of STEG, which is that if you think about what economic development is, what structural transformation is, it's, it's the reallocation of workers across either industries, occupation, or space. Um, and there, there's a sense, um, at least in, in policy circles, that distortions in the labor market are gonna hinder growth by, by stopping people or, or making it more costly for people to do that reallocation. But one of the things we're missing at sort of a high level to, to have this discussion is, is empirical evidence. Um, so we know that we see, we have data on labor market flows between employment and unemployment in rich countries. We have 
really detailed RCTs that take deep dives into um, specific labor markets of developing countries. But what we're going to try and do in this paper is bridge that gap by thinking about you know, detailed cross-country evidence on labor market flows in both rich and poor countries. So the way we're going to do that is we're going to, um, uh, my MBA students once taught me how to get rid of this thing, but I don't actually know how anymore. There we go. All right. Uh, so what we're going to do in this paper is we're going to build a new data set that consists of the underlying micro data from rotating panel labor force surveys in 49 countries. So if you're familiar with this data in the, in the US, this would be basically the micro data from the current population survey. This is the data that underlies official um, unemployment statistics in all of these countries. Um, and what's nice about it is that it has what's known as a rotating panel. So people are in the data for multiple periods in a row. That's going to let us construct flows between employment, unemployment, self-employment and wage work, et cetera, that we're going to exploit to look, look at these flows across countries. Um, we're going to be able to do so across a relatively large cut of the world income distribution with GDP per capita ranging from around $3,000 um, up through the richest countries in the world. And we're going to be able to because we have the micro data, we'll be able to go in and, and, you know, sort of do everything consistently. So we're not going to be concerned about, say, differences in the definition of what it means to be unemployed in country A versus country B, because we can go in and harmonize those all from the way that the questions are asked. We're going to use the data to essentially revisit evidence, starting from a very high level, you know, three state macro flows between employment, unemployment and inactivity. Um, we'll try and think through what it is that's causing the aggregate patterns we uncover across countries with a particular goal of trying to paint a bit of a picture of what the job ladder looks like in poor countries relative to rich countries. And then at the end of this, we'll sort of go all the way down to the micro level and we'll ask, all right, well, let's take some of these promising RCTs that intervene in the labor market and let's ask what those motivating models would have to um, would have to show if indeed they're picking up some frictions that are larger in poor countries than rich countries. So we'll try and derive some testable implications out of the models that motivate these RCTs and see if they line up with the data that we have. So on the aggregate level, what are we gonna find? Um, sort of the headline result is that when you look at exit from employment, the job finding rate and flows between jobs, all of them are negatively correlated with income. And in fact, they're about three times higher in poor countries than they are in rich countries. Now, if you're look, if you're used to looking in about, um, excuse me, if you're used to looking at labor market flows uh, within rich countries, this probably seems a little bit strange. Um, and in fact, we're not saying that anyone's wrong. We're just saying that that's sort of a narrow cut of the income distribution. When we restrict attention to rich countries, we in fact replicate this positive relationship. Um, between income and labor market flows in large part related to differences in labor market institutions across countries. So when we, you know, there's sort of two ways to think about higher flows in poor countries. One is that it's, it's a fundamental sort of reallocation of people to more productive or stable employment um, relative to, to rich countries. Um, so we're going to try and think about whether that's the case or not. And the answer is going to be, it doesn't really seem like it. Instead, what's driving the aggregate patterns that we find is mostly what we're going to think of as movements into and out of the bottom rungs of the job ladder. So people moving from non-employment into self-employment back into non-employment, or people moving from self-employment to really low earning wage work and then back to non-employment, as opposed to like a steady climb up, up the job ladder, so to speak. And we're going to provide a few pieces of evidence for that. The first is we're going to, we're going to find a very important role for self-employment. And I'll show you along a number of dimensions that people who are self-employed in developing countries look a lot like people who are unemployed in developing countries, both in terms of the wages that they earn when they move into wage work, and also the likelihood that they ever transition into wage work. Second, we're going to find that most of the turnover we observe within wage workers is coming from the bottom of the earnings distribution. Um, and in fact, we have a number of countries where we can track people for three quarters in a row. And in both self-employment and wage work, a lot of what you're going to see generating the aggregate are flows basically from non-employment into employment and then back out of employment. 
And I'll talk about, that's not to say that these aren't valuable flows and they're not providing say insurance for people or something like that, just that it doesn't seem like they're climbing up to more productive um, or stable employment. Now, the last part of this is that we're gonna try and do some accounting, um, which is facilitated by, by the fact that we have this harmonized microdata, but we're gonna find at the end of the day that it turns out to be pretty difficult to just account for what's driving this turnover. So we're gonna look at things like demographics, occupational differences across countries, the structure of employment or firm size, informality, et cetera. And about as good as we can do is we can account for about a quarter of the aggregate relationship between these aggregate flows and, uh, and income. So in light of that, we're gonna try, we're gonna, we're gonna try something a little bit different which is we're gonna instead turn to a recent promising micro development literature that has shown that certain, the ability to provide information and skills seems to increase hiring and retention. Um, and these, these RCTs have been carried out in a number of developing countries, some of which are in our data and some of which are not. And we're gonna ask, all right, well, if what those RCTs are picking up is actually frictions that are larger in poor countries than in rich countries. So they're actually, they're, you know, related to the development process in some way, what would the models that motivate those RCTs predict in terms of the patterns we should observe? So we're gonna derive testable implications from the models used to motivate these RCTs. And in particular, what they're gonna predict is they're gonna predict steeper tenure exit profiles. So people early in their tenure in a firm should exit more. And also tenure wage profiles should be steeper in, um, or sorry, should be, yeah, should be steeper in poor countries. And that sounds a little, perhaps a little bit um, unintuitive at this point, but I'll sort of walk you through, through how that works. We're going to find support for both of those um, in the sense that what we think we're doing is highlighting some external validity of, of these results and putting them in sort of the broader picture of, um, of economic development. All right, so just a brief outline here. Um, I'll talk very briefly about building the data set, just so you have a sense of what data we have available to us. Um, and then we'll sort of go through the aggregate stuff. And at the end, I'll talk a little bit about trying to link this to, to micro development interventions. So uh, basically what Todd, Will and I did was just go out and start calling statistical agencies to see who had rotating panel labor force surveys. We found 49 of them. Um, and what, what they all have in common is that they have quarterly panels. So individuals get surveyed for some number of quarters in a row that number differs depending on which country you're looking at, and then they exit the survey. They also all have micro data with identifiers, which allows us to match those people across time. So I'm gonna see the same person in Q1 and Q2. I'm gonna match them up. That's gonna be an observation. I'll do the same thing in Q2 and Q3. And what at the end of the day, that's going to give me is a data set of quarterly transitions in all of these countries. Uh, yeah, that's just some technical stuff. What do we have? Um, so what we've put together, I'm not gonna use all of this today, um, but we of course know their labor market state. So whether they're employed, whether they're unemployed, whether they've been searching for work, um, we can measure job to job transitions. I should be specific here. These are firm to firm transitions. These are not jobs within a firm. Um, we have information on their hours, earnings and wages. We know how long they've been, within, been, been in the firm. We know their contract type for most countries if you're worried about things like seasonality um, and then demographics and, and, and employer size. Uh, for today, I'm gonna focus on the urban population. Uh, there's 11 countries in our data that have only urban data. And this is um, unfortunately correlated with development. In, in poorer countries, they're less likely to go out and survey in rural areas. Um, in the paper, we do some robustness to this and this doesn't seem to be a huge problem, but um, that's just one caveat to keep in mind going through. All right, so what do we end up with? Uh, we end up with a quarterly panel of transitions covering 49 countries, 619 country years, 79 million observations, where again, an observation is somebody who I've tracked for two quarters in a row um, across countries ranging from a poor, the poorest countries in our sample are um, listed here, India and Mongolia and Nicaragua, the Philippines, um, all the way up through the US and Europe. So you'll note here, another, the second caveat, in addition to the not having, um, not having rural surveys for a number of countries, we're also not covering the poorest sub-Saharan African countries. 
This seems to be primarily a data constraint. We've talked to a lot of people in statistical agencies, and as far as we can tell, this data is not collected in, in a number of places. Um, if it is, please let us know. We would, we would love to add that. But that's caveat number two, is that you know, David Lagakos has a number of interesting papers that sort of shows that some of these patterns reverse when you get um, way down in the left tail of the income distribution. We're not going to be able to speak to that directly. Um, I can show you some evidence at the end um, that sort of suggests that's not such a huge problem uh, for us in terms of the flows, but, but I'll hold that for now. Okay, so uh, let me get into the results then. So the first thing I'm going to do is let me just define for you exactly what we're calling employed. So we're going to take the US definitions and we're going to impose them on every other country. Um, so an employed person is somebody who worked uh, last week, if you're self-employed, if you're working sufficient hours as an unpaid family worker, or, you know, if you're on vacation or sick, we're not going to, we're going to still call you employed. An unemployed person is someone who's not employed, but wants to work, is available for work, and has searched in the past month. There's some um, caveats for waiting to be recalled if you've been laid off, depending on whether you have a defined return period or not. And then anyone who's left over is just an inactive person. So this could be all sorts of people. This could be people who are not working, people who have retired for some reason, um, people who don't want a job, et cetera, or in school, for example. All right, so let me show you, let me just show you some pictures for a second. So what I've plotted here, these are, these are this is exit from employment um, to unemployment and to inactivity. These light dots in the background, those are country years. Um, the uh, sort of labeled points here, these are averages across countries just to give you a sense of, of what the countries are. And the takeaway from this is to say, well, whether they're moving from employment to unemployment or inactivity, there's sort of a clear negative trend um, with GDP per capita here. You can do the same thing for the job finding rate. It's not nearly as strong. Um, in particular, the flows from unemployment into employment um, varies quite a bit. Um, but as, you, as I'll show you in regressions in a second, you also see quite a bit of flows from inactivity into job find into employment in poor countries. So as a regression, these are just some of the same numbers I showed you, or sorry, these are just numbers related to the graphs I showed you a second ago, which are exit rates, job finding rates. I've also added a couple other ones here. These are flows between firms, um, which also is negatively related to, to GDP. Um, and then also one of the things we were sort of worried about was, was mismeasurement due to the definition of what it means to be employed in a developing country. Um, so we also looked at whether they move occupations. And in fact, again, you see a lot more occupational moves um, in developing countries relative to, to richer countries. Now, if, again, I mentioned this at the beginning, but if you're used to thinking about this in rich countries, this seems sort of strange, right? There's, there's sort of a well-defined um, story for, for labor market flows in rich countries, which is places that have less restrictive or freer labor markets tend to generate more flows because they can respond to shocks more easily. And that's sort of a measure of a healthy labor market. If I restrict our results to rich countries, that's exactly what you see. Okay. So we do some work on this, looking at labor market um, um, regulations, et cetera. Um, and it's sort of exactly replicating what people have found within rich countries. But you can sort of see this if you go back a little bit what you're picking up in rich countries is essentially this positive relationship right here, or say this positive relationship right here. But once you expand out to a broader uh, cut of the world income distribution, you realize that that's sort of like a very narrow part of what is a bigger trend in the other direction. Okay. So what we're gonna try and do is say, all right, that's sort of our headline result. So turnover is, is sort of higher in poor countries than it is in rich countries. And so now what we want to do is just think about whether we can start to account for what's happening in those aggregate flows. So what is it that's driving these flows and what is it that's causing them to be larger in poor countries? So I'm going to do a pretty simple decomposition here. Um, I'm just going to pick a flow. So imagine employment to unemployment. And then I'm going to run a regression where this thing t is equal to one if person i in country c at year t 
transitions from EDU. And I'm going to regress that on a bunch of characteristics. For the purposes of right now, these are going to be age by education by sex by occupation bins. Um, so think, you know, somebody under 25 who has a high school degree, who is a woman who is working in um, a managerial position. That's sort of the level of, of, of uh, aggregation we're thinking about here. Now, what I've showed you so far is that the average of this thing is negatively related to development. Or, yeah, sorry. <laughs> Um, right, so this thing is larger in poor countries than it is in rich countries. Once you aggregate up and take the average over all of these people. Now I'm just going to subtract off uh, Switzerland's data just to do a normalization. And it turns out once you do that, you can decompose this regression into three, three pieces. The first of which is this composition effect. The second is this country effect. And then the last part is this interaction. So what are these things saying? Well, this composition effect is saying, all right, let's take the likelihood of exit in Switzerland 2017. And then let's think about how important the fact, it, how important it is that say the occupational structure in Nicaragua is different from that of um, Switzerland, right? So this composition effect is gonna pick up how different these characteristics are for a fixed type specific transition rate. The country effect is doing the other thing. It's saying, all right, let's assume Nicaragua has the same characteristics as Switzerland, but let's ask how much different the same characteristics or how much more likely exit is for Nicaragua than Switzerland at those fixed characteristics. And then this last term is sort of the interaction of the two of them. Are there specific types of characteristics that exit a lot more in Nicaragua, but there's also a lot more of those people in Nicaragua, if you will. Now, it turns out that because um, this decomposition is linear, if I regress this thing on GDP per capita, I can then regress these three pieces individually on GDP per capita and the slope sum to the same thing. So I can decompose the relationship with GDP into exactly these three, these three effects. So when you do that, what you end up with is that composition seems to account for some, but not a ton of the results. I'm not going to stake my <laughs> I was gonna, I'm not going to stake my non-existent reputation on this on this result. But whether you want to think of these things as big or small, I'm not I'm not too concerned about. Um, the answer is but the, what I would like you to take away is that there's a lot of still unexplained variation to, to pick up here. So the composition of of different countries accounts for about a third of exit to to unemployment. It accounts for almost two thirds of the job finding rate from unemployment. It accounts for basically none of the job job flows. So what we're gonna try and do in the remaining um, 15 minutes or so is try and think through exactly what is it about the, these economies that's different and, and how can we use them to think about um, aggregate turnover across countries. So I'm gonna skip a few things that are in the paper. I'm not gonna talk about seasonality. I'm not gonna talk about labor market regulations, neither of which play a particularly important role here. Um, it, the, all of that data is in the paper. Um, so I'll, I'll skip through it in the interest of brevity. What I'd like to do now is, is look through the structure of employment with a particular focus on, on um, self-employment and, and you know, wage work differences. So um, let me show you a bunch of numbers. Don't, don't look at all of them. Let me try and walk you through them a little bit. The first thing to point out here is that if you look at the job finding rate, almost all of it is coming from, almost all of the relationship we pick up with income is coming from flows into self-employment, right? So if I look at the likelihood that somebody moves from unemployment into wage work, there's no relationship with income. It's basically a flat line. All of that action is coming because there's a lot more people moving from unemployment and inactivity into self-employment in poor countries than in rich countries. You see something very similar if you look at job job flows. What we're picking up in aggregate job job flows are just movements between wage work and self-employment, not flows between firm A and firm B um, where you're being paid a wage. So that's sort of the first point. A lot of this is being picked up by self-employment. And then the second point I wanna raise is that there's still an interesting relationship here um, between exit from wage work and income. 
And so I want to sort of walk through both of those and see sort of what's driving these results. And like I said at the beginning, try and try and paint a bit of a picture of the difference in what a job ladder looks like in, in poor countries and rich countries. Okay, so uh, let me just jump right in and start with self-employment. In a few, in I should say about half of our countries, we can track people for more than two quarters. So let me show you what it looks like when somebody transitions. Um, so for half of them, we'll look at these three quarter transitions. So what I've plotted here is somebody who moves from unemployment to self-employment, and then in the third quarter, one of these other states, so unemployment, inactivity, self-employment, and wage work. Um, and you see, you see two things that, that sort of pop out here. One is that if you look at new entrants into self-employment, and I should say these are color-coded in a way that red means more likely to happen in a rich country and blue means more likely to happen in a poor country. So these are the, the coefficients on regressions with GDP per capita by each of these flows. So if you look at new entrants into self-employment, the overwhelming result in rich countries is that people stay in self-employment. It seems like a much more permanent state once you enter in rich countries than in poor countries. If you look at what people are doing in poor countries, it's true that some of them jump up to wage work, but by and large, they're falling right back into non-employment of some capacity. Similarly, if you look at people who are self-employed and who do manage to find a wage work job the next quarter, most of those people in poor countries are moving back into self-employment. Whereas again, in rich countries, wage work is sort of a permanent, a more permanent space. All right, so this is something that's gonna come up throughout these results is that employment states in, in rich countries seem much more permanent than they, than they do in poor countries. So if self-employment is not sort of this like first step up the, up the job ladder, what is it? Well, it turns out it looks quite a bit like self-employment, or sorry, it looks quite a bit like unemployment. So what do we mean by that? Well, what I've plotted over here, these are the likelihood of a flow into wage work for um, unemployed people relative to self-employed people. So let me just pick a country out here um, that's sort of extreme, France. So what this is saying is that somebody who is unemployed in France is 25 times more likely to end up in wage work the next quarter than a person who is self-employed in France. If you look down here at say India, um, this is Palestine, Nicaragua, the Philippines, that number is around 1.6. Now you can remove all these countries. This is all still positive and everything. Um, but what that's saying is that unemployment in poor countries, in terms of their flows into wage works, or sorry, I should say self-employed people in poor countries are about as likely to move into wage work as people who are unemployed, where that seems to differ quite a bit in rich countries. You can do something very similar with earnings. So what I've plotted here, these are the, the red line here. These are the earnings of an unemployed person who moves into wage work in the next quarter. So once they enter, what wages do they earn? The blue line is what are the wages earned by a self-employed person who moves into wage work? And I've normalized both of them by people who are uh, wage workers in both quarters. And again, what you can see here is that there's not a lot of relationship with income if you look at the wages the, the, new, the formerly unemployed are earning. But if you look at what, what earnings are, or sorry, what self-employed people, formerly self-employed people are earning, they're quite a bit higher in rich countries than poor countries. All of which suggests what you're seeing in, in poor countries is a different type of selection into, into uh, wage work from self-employment as opposed to uh, rich countries where people are earning a much larger premium when they do make that move. Now, that's not to say that none of this is valuable. Um, in fact, it does seem to be providing a, a pretty useful service to people who are moving between, um, who are moving into self-employment in poor countries. And in particular, what, what I've plotted here, or what I've, what I've shown here, is that imagine somebody who goes from wage work to self-employment and then back to wage work. I'm doing that because I want to think of these self-employed people as probably people who are truly using this for um, sort of an un a way to informally earn some income um, during what would we would generally think of as an unemployment spell. 
And if you look at their earnings losses between quarter one in wage work and their second quarter of self-employment, on average, they're only losing about 15% of their earnings. So this does seem like it's providing a floor in terms of level of income um, that is valuable to people, even if it's not necessarily you know, the first step on, on the road to more stable employment. Sort of in a similar vein, um, I generally think of if I'm thinking about like the U.S., what's what's sort of the unemployment thing you would what's the unemployment value you would put into the model? It would be something like 40 percent of the equilibrium wage. If you just look at who's who loses less than 60 percent of their earnings, basically three out of four people. So it's doing a pretty good job of you know keeping earnings at a relatively high level um, through self-employment. Okay, so let me just recap for a second. So we, we have these aggregate flows that are negatively correlated with income. And it seems like self-employment plays a critical role in understanding them, despite, um, but primarily looks like an unemployment substitute and not a lot of evidence that it kickstarts some climb up the job ladder. Okay. So what I wanna think about now is, is moving, moving into wage work and going back to where I started, which is there's still this negative relationship between income and exit from wage work that we might wanna think, think more about. So let me just show you some separation results here. Um, this is separation by earnings decile. So separation here being a movement um, either out of employment or to a new job. And I've plotted just a few countries here, uh, Peru and Bolivia, versus Denmark and France. And what you see is that if you look at the top earners in any country, they look pretty similar in their likelihood of, of moving, um, of separating from their job. But if you look at you know, the bottom part of the earnings distribution, there's just a massive difference. There's like a three or four fold difference um, in the likelihood of exiting in poor countries relative to rich. That ratio is around 1.2 if you go up to the top part here. This is not something about the countries that I picked to put on this graph. If you regress the likelihood of separation on GDP per capita across these deciles, you get sort of the same picture in regression form. The, the semi-elasticity with, with respect to income is around negative 0.2 in the bottom and very close, but not exactly zero up at the top. So again, most of the action we're seeing is coming down from the bottom of these, these earnings distributions where people are, are exiting a lot. But again, you can ask the same question. Is it the case that what's happening is that we're seeing a bunch of separation as people start to climb the job ladder from these low earning jobs? And again, the answer seems to be that's not the case. So what I've plotted here are again, these three quarter flows. So flows, people who move from unemployment to wage work. And then what I have here are, are um, unemployment, inactivity, self-employment, and then lower wages, the same wages or higher wages. Um, and so I won't make you look at this whole thing. Let me just collapse a few of them. And what you see is that people, new entrants into wage work in poor countries, they're much, much more likely to fall back down. So either to um, self-employment, non-employment or lower wage jobs. And then the same thing is true if you look at people who actually do take that first step and see their wages go up between quarter one and quarter two chances are in poor countries, they're much more likely to sort of fall back down uh, the job ladder, if you will. So if you put all of this together, oops, sorry. If you put all of this together, you sort of get the, the point that I was trying to make at the beginning, hopefully, which is that we're seeing a lot of turnover across countries. If you look at the aggregate data, it doesn't seem to be people sort of moving up the job ladder in any particular way, but what we seem to be capturing is a lot of churn, if you will, among non-employment, subsistence self-employment, and low earnings wage jobs that's showing up in the aggregate data. Now, we can do the same type of decomposition looking at employment exit. Um, and here I'm gonna add in some firm characteristics as well. And again, what you find is that composition accounts for about 10 to 15% of, of the total flows, the total exit from wage work that we're observing. Okay. A lot of it seems to be coming from something that we can't observe in the data or through some sort of equilibrium force that's not being picked up in these sort of simple accounting decompositions that we're doing. So motivated by that point, what we're going to try and turn to now um, 
is you know, asking whether we can sort of think through theories that sort of speak to these unexplained parts of, of exit. And for that, we're going to um, we're going to take as sort of our benchmark some successful labor market interventions that have been done on the micro on the micro side, and use those models um, as motivation to think about um, to think about different theories. So, what do, what are we going to do? So, there's been this this recent um, push of interventions in the labor market, which I would I would highly recommend reading. They're all very interesting papers, but they all sort of broadly paint the same picture, which is that the claim is that there's limited information about worker skills or match quality more broadly. And so all of these papers in some way or another do something to provide workers either information about their own skills or makes worker skills verifiable to firms. And if you read these papers, it's kind of great because they're all motivated by the same three models. Um, so it's going to make my life a little bit easier. They're all motivated by models in which matches are uncertain, and therefore there's value in terms of retention um, or hiring by providing that kind of information. So what we're going to do is we're going to take those interventions and we're going to ask, all right, well, let's say that those frictions are indeed larger in poor countries than in rich countries. What types of predictions would those motivating models make? And does our cross-country data line up with it? So just to sort of briefly sketch this out, we're gonna do this in a very simple way. You can do it more complicated, but um, this gets our point across, I think, well enough. So each period, think about a world in which um, a vacancy randomly meets a non-employed person, and they're gonna draw some match specific productivity X out of some distribution that everybody knows. The key friction in the model is that, um, or I should say the key distortion in the model is that match specific productivity is unknown. And instead what you observe is only a signal of that, of that match quality. With probability P, that's gonna be the truth. With probability one minus P, that signal is gonna be a random draw out of this distribution F. So the key thing to keep in mind here and what motivates those RCTs I was just saying is that think about a world in which P is close to zero. In that case, workers are what, what you would call experience goods. In the sense that you have to, you have to, if you're a firm, you have to hire a worker and bring them into your firm before you can even realize whether they're a good or bad worker. And so both sides are going to learn the true match quality with probability lambda if they're producing. Um, and then people are going to destroy matches if, if the matches turn out to be relatively low quality. So I'm running, I'm running very short on time. So let me just make a couple quick points here. Um, this is gonna make two predictions. One is that the exit rate should decline with tenure and also that tenure wage profiles should be steeper in poor countries. So why is that? Well, if you look at the likelihood of exiting um, from, from the firm based on how long the worker has been in the firm, you should get something that looks like this. Why? Well, in rich countries, because they have pretty good signals of who's a good and who's a bad worker, most of that screening can happen before the hiring even takes place. So you should get these low but constant exit hazards. There's no information revealed if you already know how good everyone is. You do your selection beforehand. Whereas in poor countries, you end up hiring a bunch of people who turn out to be pretty bad workers. And you, as you learn about them, you start firing them. But if we just focus on a part of the tenure distribution that's somewhere up here, well, all of the bad people have already been fired from the firm. And so if you just look up here, they should look pretty similar between rich and poor countries. There's really no information left to learn once everybody who works for you has been in the firm for you know, 10 years or something. Indeed, if you look at those results, that's exactly what you see. So you see tenure, most of what we're picking up in terms of wage exit is coming from low levels of tenure, so below six months. And there's sort of this very clear pattern as you increase the tenure where this thing becomes flatter and flatter across countries. The second prediction has a very similar flavor in the sense that it's all a function of how selection happens. Wages in rich countries should be high but flat. Why is that? Well, if all workers are already known to be high, high quality, we should pay them a high wage from the start, but there shouldn't be any sort of learning over time. Whereas in poor countries, what you're picking up 
is that as the bad workers are as as bad workers are fired and good workers are revealed to be good, the average wage in in poor countries is going to grow very quickly with tenure. So let me just show you those results in the interest of time here. Um, in fact, that's exactly what you see. You see returns, average returns to tenure are quite a bit higher in poor countries than rich countries. And I should emphasize, this is all selection. This is not like the individual level returns to, to being on a job longer. Okay, so let me just conclude. Sorry, sorry for taking an extra minute. Um, what we've done is, is built a new database on quarterly labor market flows, where we find that turnover is quite a bit higher in poor countries than rich countries but almost all of it is concentrated at low rungs of the job ladder. Um, and as I was just saying, there seems to be some additional evidence that's consistent with recent micro level evidence um, derived from RCTs that suggests that what, what those results, what those RCTs are picking up is something that does seem to have some bite at least in sort of the broader uh, cross country context. So I'll stop there, um, thanks. Um, thank you, Kevin, for a very interesting talk. Um, so there was already a lively discussion in the chat. Um, we might come back to some of those um, at the end, but let me first hand the floor to Richard Rogers, who has a question. Oh, thanks, Michelle. Thanks, Kevin. Very uh, interesting talk. Two questions. One is, in, originally, you cut everything by uh, GDP per capita, some measure of income, and talk about differences. I mean. In terms of some of the patterns you talk about, it seems it could be also interesting to talk about variation by uh, countries by variation in, in the fraction of self-employment relative to total employment, which of course is highly correlated with income, but I'm wondering, there's probably some middle income countries where there's a fair bit of uh, variation in the self-employment rate and how much of this some of the, the patterns you give, if a country mechanically has more self-employed people, then of course it's not very likely that an unemployed person goes to wage employment as opposed to self-employment because because th those fractions are, are different. So that, anyways, I'm wondering if you cut it that way. The second question is what you did at the end, it seems an alternative story is that in poor countries, there's all kinds of temporary jobs uh, that are filled by low skilled workers and that would also generate some of those patterns. So if you ask if you've thought about that at all. Yeah, yeah, thanks. Um, that's a good point on the first one. Yeah, you're certainly right that just, you know, mechanically with more self-employment, there should be more flows into self-employment. Um, we haven't sort of cut it, I guess sort of one way to think about it would be yeah, income somehow controlling for the level of self-employment or something like that. So you could get countries with similar income levels, but different self-employment levels. Um, we haven't done that. That's a good suggestion. Um, on the second one, uh, yeah, we've looked into sort of the temporary worker issue a lot. Um, and that does not seem to be what's driving the results. Um, I, think, I think in large part, the way I would describe it is that it's true that there are a lot of temporary jobs in developing countries. But it also turns out that jobs that are not defined as temporary turn over at a rate that is very close to those that are explicitly temporary. Um, but so yeah, so when we when we do sort of those last parts on like the tenure wage profiles and such, we can control for occupation and contract type, and that does not does not seem to change anything. Can I ask one quick follow up, which is, is there information in the surveys for a worker that left a job? Why did you leave your last job? And if so, have you looked at that? Yeah, we tried. Um, it's spotty. Um, so it's hard to come up with, say, cross-country patterns on that. Um, if I remember correctly, there's maybe three or four countries where you can get that information. OK, sorry. I can you hear me now? Yes. Um, so thanks for answering that question. So Richard, did you have another question? Your hand is still up? No, okay. No, I just forgot to lower it, sorry. <laughs> okay, so let's move on to Ahmed Azan. Thank you. Uh, very interesting presentation. Uh, so one question is, you did not refer to education uh, uh, and 
Uh, I take it incomes can proxy and so on, but cannot proxy also. So again, uh, so uh, why didn't you consider education or have you done it? One. And second is, I ask is because, you know, some work that we did in India even 10 years ago, earlier, we found that self-employment segment of workers in India, there was this group where wages and earnings were actually quite high and comparable to wage workers. So you had more like a rich country syndrome. The labor market was segmented enough that educated people were going into self-employment and getting high earnings. So that kind of nuance, with, can you sort of uh, show some light, throw some light on that? Yeah, sure, thanks. Um, so, so on the first one, we do, we do include education. Um, it turns out it doesn't account for very much of what we're picking up. Um, it, it, as you correctly point out, it is true that you know rich countries are much more educated. Um, I should caveat this, and in particular because Todd's on this call somewhere, uh, we don't think about say differences in education quality. So when I'm talking about education, I'm say I'm saying oh well, let's look at people who didn't finish high school versus people who did versus people who went to college. Um, and that doesn't seem to pick up very much, but to the extent that that's mixing places of high and low quality, um, that would sort of show up in our residual. So I, I'm sympathetic to that idea. Um, on your second point, I, I think you're sort of exactly right. I mean, this is something that I think comes out pretty clearly here, which is there's some type of person in, you know, India is not on this graph, but the pattern looks exactly the same. There's some type of person who looks very similar to a Denmark worker, right? There's somebody in Peru who looks very similar to somebody in Denmark in terms of their likelihood of exiting um, or separating, I should say, from their firm. Um, what, what these results point to is that we don't really have a good sense of what that thing is, and it doesn't seem to be super well proxied by the observables that we can see. Um, so part of it is education, and then part of it is something else that we're not sort of sure what it is, but I think that point is exactly exactly spot on. There, there's something, there's some type of person that indeed looks like they're in a rich country, even when they're in India. Yeah, thanks. Um, okay, so the next question is from Louise Fox. Do you wanna ask it, Louise? Yeah. Okay, uh, let's see, I'm unmuting and I'm lowering my hand, there we are. Um, <laughs> I really like this paper and I, I'm really interested in your data set. Uh, maybe we can have conversations later about uh, whether it's available for others to use, but um, I think it's the kind of data set and work that we really need. Um, and I would make, um, I, I raised a couple of questions in the chat about some details of how you coded it. I'm not gonna go there, but uh, what I would say about the last part about you know looking at these RCTs on matching and what to the day to do. Uh, so first of all, um, these RCTs on matching don't create jobs, right? And so um, if there are say a fixed number of jobs at a given point in time, I mean, the number of, of wage jobs would change over time with uh, investment, but if there's a fixed number of jobs at a certain point of time, often what they do is they redistribute jobs. So people who are less advantaged uh, can get into jobs. And, and uh, I would argue, say, in South Africa or something, that's a good thing to do and, and worth investing in. Um, but uh, And they may have an effect on productivity. I think that is a little bit not as well established. Uh, a few of these uh, do look at that, right? But if there's no more jobs created by this, per se, then you know, your results aren't surprising, right? And But I guess I'm wondering whether you're actually really testing the model of the labor market that they have because it's a micro model and, and not a general equilibrium. Does that make sense? Uh, um, yeah, I, I think so. Um, um, so yeah, it's a good question. I have to go back and look at the these papers about whether they actually create new jobs. I mean, that's, that's certainly those, those types of, um, those types of issues are certainly top of mind whenever you're trying to, to pull out welfare measures from one of these RCTs or something like that, or aggregate measures more broadly. Um, um, I, yeah, so I think your, your points are well taken. And I would say what we're trying to do, we're specifically not trying to take a stand on 
the aggregate implications of these models because it depends on a lot of things that you were just saying, which is, you know, what are the costs of firing someone? What are the costs of hiring a new person or posting a vacancy? And how do those interact with changes in the, um, the signal quality or the signal precision um, of, of match quality, et cetera? And so we don't really have anything to say about that because our data doesn't let us speak to it. As you could, like, I guess one way to summarize what we're doing is, as you'll sort of notice maybe within just this graph, I didn't say it out loud, but these are all results that are functions that are conditional on people already being hired into the firm, right? So we're saying, if once you get hired, here is what the patterns should look like. And that's because we're interested in exit and sort of by definition, that means somebody has to be in the firm already. But I think it's a really important question going forward to exactly that point is thinking about like, well, okay, if the micro evidence suggests these frictions seem to matter at you know the very micro level in terms of how they re maybe even just redistribute jobs and they seem to be consistent with cross country data, I think the next step for you know, us or STAG or, or whoever is to think about like what that means for welfare and how we think about those displaced workers and things like that, which we have nothing to say about here, unfortunately, but, but your points are, are very well taken. So I see lots more raised hands. So let's um, ask short questions and try to answer them shortly so that we can get through all of them. So Callum has another question. Sure, yes, uh, very interesting paper. And uh, the results are surprising to me, not least because uh, my own experience of uh, traveling in developing countries and visiting places is often that uh, people that I meet uh, find jobs very hard to get and then uh, hold on to them come what may often when they get them. So often I, I see that people have very long tenures in jobs, but these are often in, I think, the more informal kind of jobs or, uh, you know, the kind of, of very small organizations that perhaps wouldn't be picked up by your surveys or by the methods you're doing. So my first question is that, do you think there's maybe a possibility of another uh, other side of this economy, which is perhaps more informal or more small scale, which uh, where, they, where we see an opposite thing, where uh, of perhaps lower productivity workers remaining very long tenures in uh, some other sectors of the developing country economy Economies. And in that case, that there may be some kind of a balance uh, out in the middle. Uh, maybe I won't ask my second question for uh, to give others a chance. Yeah, so I'm, I'm going to, in the interest of short answers, uh, no, I don't think that. Um, and the reason I don't think that is because, so these are dwelling surveys, which means that they pick up in informal employment. And so I know, in principle, you know, setting aside issues of measurement error and things that, that one might worry about, um, I know if you're in an informal firm and I, I know if you're informally self-employed and I know if you earn income, um, even, even short-term income. Um, I would suggest, I think, I think something we do in the paper that, that I'll just point to is that the definition of what it means to collect this data differs a lot depending on which survey you look at. So if you look at say the LSMS, the way they ask these labor market questions is quite a bit different than the way labor force surveys do. And so I suspect when people are thinking things like that, I think it's more definitional than I than I think there's some other labor market that we're not capturing. With the caveat that we don't have most of the sub-Saharan, like poor sub-Saharan African countries. Sure. Just another very short note is that I also noticed that a lot of companies, for example, during COVID, were laying workers off and then rehiring the same workers again a, a short time later. So. Uh, if that's the case, is there also a possibility that this uh, volatility of employment tenure could also just reflect vol volatility of uh, firm performance? Um, firm performance, yes. Layoffs, no, because layoffs are not included um, in non-employment. Okay, so then I guess next question. Annika, <laughs> sorry, my daughter. Um, Markus Poschke is asking a next question. Yes, so uh, great work, very interesting. It's nice to follow how this is coming along. So I have a um, question about one element here that uh, I hadn't seen before in your work, which is in the Oaxaca blinder decomposition. Um, if I remember well, I remember, it, I think in the back of my mind, it seems that when, when you do that, the choice of the reference country matters for the decomposition you do, I think, right? So I, I might be wrong on that. Um, and you chose like Switzerland, which uh, surprised me a bit. So I'm just wondering you know whether it's it's true that the choice of reference country matters and if you've checked robustness to that yeah it, it does matter qualitatively quantitatively we've done it in switzerland mexico south africa and mongolia and the results don't change that much but but you're exactly right that it's it's an important robustness check 
And then one more question from Sian. I don't know if Hi. I'm saying your name right. <laughs> it's Kian. Uh, yeah, thanks. So uh, Kevin, like, yeah, really cool paper. You know, I, I like this lot. I was just curious about those last results in particular about screening and how related do you think that some of these labor market facts are related to the different firm size distribution in poor versus richer countries? And in particular, if screening is a big issue, for example, small firms, and, and these are fixed costs, small firms may simply not be able to afford uh, to cover them. And so you might actually be able to see interesting heterogeneity for large versus small firms. Now, I guess you can see that in just the, the labor market data you have, but I'm wondering, are there facts that we know from the literature that might be helpful in understanding this? Yeah, yeah, and this sort of touches on Callum's point too about like firm volatility sort of comes into play here too, um, which might differ a bit by, by firm size. Um, that's a good question. Todd, you can, Todd, you can jump in if I miss anything here. Um, showed up just when he thought the questions were over, which was, which was smart. Um, um, so yeah, so I, it's a good point. So what we've done here is we, we've run these same things controlling for firm size um, and occupations and things like that. And it doesn't seem like that sort of gets rid of the result, but that's sort of more accounting than I think what you're after, which is, is there just interesting heterogeneity, even if the slopes don't sort of necessarily change sign? Um, that's a good question. I, I don't know the answer to that, unfortunately. Um, and then in terms of the literature, I'd have to go back and check. I have a list of things, but I think Chad Severson has a recent paper that sort of points to, to some of this, um, but I won't, I won't speculate on those without looking at it closer. The most closely related paper is by Hall to Wanger. He says about half of cross-country difference in job flows is down to industry and firm size, which we can control for. Thank you. So given we have a few more minutes, I wanted to see if there was a lively debate in the chat. Is Was everything answered or do people, I think uh, Min and Louise, several people had question, is there anything we should come back to? If not, you know, think about it and raise your hand if you want. Um, in the meantime, I will ask one more question and it's related to something I think Louise was asking in the chat. Um, so you've been looking at these different labor market statuses, unemployment, and, and you're looking specifically at self-employment, but what if you also cut it into formal and informal wage work? Because that is really important in some of these developing countries and doesn't exist all that much in, in richer countries. And I'm just wondering if you could also look at those kind of flows and have you done that? Yeah, we have. Um, and it, it's, it was, this was sort of, I think our first our first cut at the data way back when, whenever this whenever this paper started, um, it turns out um, in an accounting sense, informality can't account for very much of the aggregate flows. Um, and it's true that informal jobs do turn over a lot in poor countries. It's just that formal jobs turn over a lot too. Um, and I should caveat this answer, you know, given given the focus of Steg, which is that's very much an accounting result. But you could imagine a world. So the story you would have to have to, 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 um, to account for the aggregate flows couldn't just be there are more informal workers in poor countries and they turn over more in, in informal. It would have to be something through an equilibrium effect, like the size of the tax base gets so much smaller and somehow that causes more formal firms to, to exit or formal firms to exit or formal workers to exit. Um, but in a purely accounting sense, yeah, it seems like they both turn over quite a bit. Okay, thank you. Any other final remarks or questions? So I might just, Michelle, I might just follow up on that last point. Um, I think you could have an interesting paper, by the way, to say of the following RCTs, here's where we have our results are consistent. So your results are consistent, for example, with all of the work that um, Blattman and others did on Ethiopia, where uh, the firms hire the wrong people and the people don't like the jobs and they quit a lot because they don't know much about wage jobs. And I I've seen that anecdotally uh, as well as in the data, um, but they're not consistent maybe with some other uh, particular um, RCTs. And um, sorry. And anyway, you just might want to think about that. Yeah, it's a great point. That's that's literally what we're doing right now. Um, we're trying now to build in some of the other types of RCTs that people have run, whether they be something like, um, you know, what would happen if you took this model we wrote down and then put wage subsidies in it? 
like would you get sort of the results back from the wage, wage subsidy RCTs and things like that? Um, so yeah, I, I think that's a great point and I, I'm heartened to hear it. <laughs> Well, thanks for all the lively discussion. Um, and before handing the floor back to the organizers who might want to say some final words, uh, let me also thank the organizers um, for, for you know, this very um, stimulating conference. Thank you. Thank you so much, Michelle. And, and thanks to everyone for sticking around. Uh, for those of you in, in Europe and for your daughter, Michelle, it's getting, it's getting late. And uh, for those in, Africa and Asia even later. Um, just want to thank everyone for participating so well and so fully. And I also, again, and particularly want to thank the, the team from CEPR that has done um, just extraordinary work to make this run smoothly. Um, Mandy Chan in particular, um, Kirsty McNeil and Ed Sellers, who are the key people making STEG run, and Alexander Ackerboom, who was helping out in the, in the breakout rooms, just really appreciate their contributions. We look forward to being, to continuing to interact with this group and uh, please just stay involved. We, um, we will be sending out another newsletter before long. There's lots of stuff going on. And I just wanna thank you all. Thanks for making this community a, a, an exciting place to be intellectually. And let's stay in touch. Thanks everyone. <laughs>